Hello and welcome back once again to a normal edition of the Tetracast. This is RPG Sites weekly podcast where we get the site staff together to talk about our favorite genre of video games. As we're going back to a normal routine for this podcast, we're back to the normal crew. Uh, let's go through them. My name is Brian Vitale. Joining me, we have George Foster. Hello, everyone. Josh Torres. Oh, no, we get to talk about what we're playing again. Oh, fuck. Uh, damn it. Adam Vitale. Hey, guys. James Galizio. Teamwork makes the dream work. And Chaos Minwoo. <laughs> Hi guys, Chow Minwu. Thanks for joining again. So yeah, obviously last week we had our big long uh, E3 roundup podcast, and then we took the week off before then. Uh, kind of a little bit back to normalcy, even though we do have a lot of big features to talk about. Uh, a couple of big headlines that came out in the last seven days. So normal podcast, but an exciting one. Uh, and also, as we alluded to. We haven't been able to talk about the games we've been playing uh, recently, and uh, if anyone has been following the RPG space at all, you know that late May into June into July has been and continues to be pretty damn crowded. So a lot of us are still like furiously working through a bunch of different games, a bunch of different demos on top of our different opportunities for like stuff we're covering for the site or previews, all of that stuff. So we have a lot to sort out and go through. This is the normal part where I go, I don't know who should start. I kind of want to start with, uh, let's see, I want to pick George, because I want to pick on him, plus Woo. he has some he has some interesting top, uh, interesting games listed here. So, yeah, yeah, you're the first one to go in three weeks to, have to talk about games you've been playing, so no pressure. <laughs> think on. carefully on. on what, uh, yeah, think carefully <laughs> on what you're going to choose first, because this will be the first, like, game in nearly a month that we're actually going to talk about on what we've been playing. It has to be, like, a big okay, I've got show stopper. Okay, Marvel's Avengers. No, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, All right, let's go. I should have seen that, that coming. Yeah, it. Let's display that IP address. <laughs> let's go. It, it was that. It was that. Or by a mutant. Uh, no, actually, I will start with Final Fantasy VII uh, episode intermission. Oh, that's a good one. Um, yeah, yeah. I was going to do Ratchet, but I've got less say on that. Uh, it, the the thing is with episode of intermission it's really really good but a lot of what excited me personally I don't think I could talk about yet like I don't I don't know if anyone has anyone else played it yet I have or, played it and just just to set the stage a little bit this is for anyone who doesn't recognize the title it's the specific PS5 Ufi DLC for Final Fantasy VII remake and I also just finished this one just literally last night uh, I agree that it's kind of a hard one to talk about well let's just let George continue uh, his thoughts yeah yeah um. It's yeah, it's pretty good. Uh, I think I enjoyed it a lot more when I was going through it, and then looking back, I was like, like not super impressed by the end of it. Like I, I liked Yuffie and I liked Sonon, but in terms of what it does as an episode, I was just kind of like, eh, it's okay. Um, I would probably agree with Alex's review that he put on the site, uh, which he ended up giving it an eight. I'd probably agree with that. I would say that the most interesting thing it does is probably the platforming sort of elements um i really enjoyed that like i think that's a really interesting element that i'm not sure whether they'll bring into the next uh part or not but it was it was really interesting like that uh the story is <laughs> divisive as ever i think but i said this last year and i'll stick by this every single time i think that is for the best i think that is it makes it really really interesting um Maybe maybe like at a later date, Brian and I will chat about it a bit more. I don't want to like spoil any of it. Uh but yeah, really, really good. Uh I thought I'd have more to say about it, to be honest. Like Yeah, no, no actually what I was gonna say about it is that this is gonna sound kind of silly, but it feels like a DLC ass DLC. Like it's the very yeah, typical yeah. like takes it took me like 10 hours, but I was also really, really slow. And I played everyone in Fort Condor and I got the max score on the different yeah. mini games or whatever. But it's just like without spoiling anything, that's the one thing that makes it difficult to talk about is that it doesn't really change the stakes much. Like where intergrade, sorry, intermission ends and where it begins, nothing really like meaningfully shifts. There are a few things and I don't want to spoil those, but it's not like there's this big Nomuro 
oh my god what the fuck at the end that like really establishes like you have to play this before you go to the next part of the remake because it's yeah, really yeah. not like that it feels more like background which is fun and you get new characters and you get some different like perspectives on events in the original game but it's it doesn't feel like there's some times where you have like an epilogue or a DLC, which ends up being, oh, this is the real ending of the game or the real, you know, story key element that you have to know going going past that. But uh, it's, I don't know. No. You have a linear level at the start, which is basically just introducing uh, Yuffie and, you know, the premise and all that. Then you have like a little bit of like a an open area section like you do in late in the original game where it's like, welcome to sector seven. And, uh, you get to play for condor and this is all stuff in the trailer. So this is, this is not spoilers. This is just what the DLC is. And you get to do a few little side objectives and fight a few times and learn how the battle system works. Uh, and then from that point on, from like the 40% point to the end, it's pretty much just a linear Factory. experience completely yeah, yeah just start to finish fight cutscene fight cutscene fight cutscene end and it's fun like i the way i described it makes it sound like it's really dull and it's not that it's dull it's just that it's like it's it's a, it's a dlc it feels kind of skippable which uh, yeah, i guess i'm not that agree. passionate i'm not that passionate about it it didn't really blow my socks off it didn't really like make me say this is essential for you for the final fantasy it doesn't feel essential i would say yuffie as a character is really really well done here like the juxtaposition between cloud who is stoic and well the 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 thing that cloud is like a generic anime character i don't like i've never liked that because i think he's really charming in his own ways in remake but besides the point yuffie is like it's like the difference between ichiban in like a dragon like it is so it's so night and day. Like Yuffie is just so energetic and full of energy and so like open. What, and that makes what I like. More... What I like about her is that she's really confident in herself, which is kind of yeah. a foil to the other two characters, which she doesn't interact with. Uh, but like Tifa is really actually quite like reserved, and then Aerith is really like outgoing. But she's kind of she kind of is in like a snarky sort of way, and that's kind of like deliberate. Like it kind of belies their appearance. And that was Nomura, I know, has been on the record saying that that's supposed to be kind of a subversion there. But Yuffie is the sort of thing like when she first meets Sonan who is the other protagonist in this DLC Sonan basically says like you're in charge I have a few years on you and referring to being a few a little bit older but you've been doing this longer and Yuffie's like all right I like the sound of that I'll be the boss like she's like she doesn't say like oh no 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 I don't want to do that like she's really like yeah I I know what I'm yeah, capable yeah. of I know I know that I'm good at this good at what I do so I really kind of like that she she goes into everything with that like brimming confidence which is actually kind of nice because none of the other maybe barrett but in a very different way none of the other characters yeah, really yeah, go yeah. in. well even Cla she does it in her own way and she she doesn't feel like she's just like a diet version of someone else or an alternative version of someone else so i'm really excited i guess to see her interact with the main cast going forward to, to have this that's what i was thinking i think that's yeah. the important part about this intermission dlc is when you compare it to the original it does so much to establish like give the yuffie like story even like an origin that's like a, a starting point because obviously in the original uh yuffie was just an optional character that you can recruit and you didn't really know much about her because she really wasn't uh by design like core to the essential plot to the critical mm -hmm. plot and you only knew about her like throughout through, through the edges and whatnot so you know that's why i really like like this intermission dlc is because now that moving forward they can now account for where she is from rather than someone who kind of comes out of nowhere as like a bonus for the game uh so that I, i'm really really curious to see where they they bring her character moving forward and whatnot now that she'll be like more of an essential mainstay um when she gets to the main cast i think that it's really good at like kind of spicing up like just little just little world building tidbits and character relationships like even just like with the the fort condor section you go challenge opponents that were in uh, you know the remake like you go uh challenge like the 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 speed demon motorcycle dude i forgot his name already and then you uh, go challenge like i Jet, rolled like, that guy so hard <laughs> yeah. he, i was okay. like oh oh he's here yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I then you, you and you do play like a little bit of a uh, yeah avalanche crew uh, uh -huh. when they're in sector was, seven and they're playing yeah, apparently cool in the downtime like they played uh yeah it was, it's yeah, it's cool seeing Jesse just like just chilling out at like the outside of Outer Heaven or uh, Seventh Heaven or whatever the fuck is the barber's called. I already forgot. Seventh, um, heaven. seventh heaven. I'm thinking of Metal Gear. <laughs> 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 uh, 
<laughs> and then so like it's just it's just those little things that that re- really excite me because uh, you get to hear like what people's like thoughts are outside of like the main cloud group and that's really cool i also really think that this intermission dlc is starting to like starting to play with light elements of what we may see in like future games uh moving forward like when you think about yuffie's play style yuffie's play style okay just but on a bare basic concept she has her shuriken you uh you she can you can attack with the shuriken up close but then you can actually throw it and uh, uh once that's thrown out you have a different move set you're now casting spells from uh, with no mp required just like but you're still doing elemental damage um but without the shuriken of course you can go through the standard magic route and have more powerful spells that consume resources but then she has a really neat thing when sonon joins up where you can actually like activate like a mode where uh like sonon joins in with your attacks like your uh, your attack attacking in conjunction with sonon so that like opens up more um options for you uh because he's there and i really wonder if they're going to start pivoting in that direction whether they're going to like allow for a mode in future iterations of ff7 remake like say with cloud and tifa attacking together or like uh tifa and barrett you know uh working together yeah have some sort of like tactical um foundation around it and th- that's really mm. um you know exciting if they if they uh, go into that direction and it all, it all flows really well because the performance mode this game running at 60 fps like it feels really good it's, this might sound a little silly crazy. but uh i originally played it in graphics mode because i was taking screenshots I'm like i gotta play in graphics mode if i'm going to take screenshots in my playthrough and then when i started i just started like hard mode i'm like all right time to go to performance mode oh god thank god <laughs> like yeah uh, it's so much better <laughs> but, but then, I, I will uh, say this ryan the, you do know that most games nowadays when you go into photo mode it'll automatically change to well I, well i wasn't using the, right? the the i wasn't using the um photo mode i was using the capture card just taking stills what what i was gonna say is um i i the 60 frames is like a massive massive boost like it it helps the combat so much the combat was really amazing but it is a big improvement but i I don't really notice many of the other differences that much like it does look better but i'd be hard pressed to find like besides the door okay the door does look better like i'd be hard pressed to find anywhere that's like, oh my god, that's night and day. Like, I needed this upgrade. Um, and the dual sense stuff, like, I know dual sense doesn't really matter, but well, no, I like dual sense. I don't know why I just said that. Yeah, dual sense does matter, <laughs> but like, there's no, there's no integration at all. Like, it is useless besides like pressing a lever, you'll hear like a clunk sometimes. Uh, and that's kind of a shame. Um, I, I wonder if like, future, just, no, like future, future iterations of remake, maybe it'll be next gen exclusive and like it'll be built up with next gen. Like, hopefully, I, yeah, I, I hope so. I'd, I'd yeah, like I hope to, so. that, but. to make the most out of it, I think I think it needs to be. To be honest, um, but yeah, to your your point, Josh, like Yuffie's combat style, uh, really, really, really fun, really overpowered with Sonon. Like it's really easy to just like like mash people like really easily, uh, but it is a lot of fun and it's very distinct. Uh, it sounds like I, I was really down on it, but it is just more Final Fantasy VII remake with a different like flavor. Um, and more than anything else, I think I say this every time we talk about remake. I am just more excited for what they're going to do next than anything. Like I love looking back on the first; it is a fantastic game. But like, what's next is you know the big one for me personally. One thing that I and did think about the combat that weird. didn't work quite as well as the base game was. In the base game, you would play as one of your three characters, and then you would deal your damage or your spells or your attacks, and then you would take aggro or threat or whatever you want to call it, enmity. Um, and then at that point, it felt like the, the design was to change characters because like, okay, uh, now Barrett's open to do his attack or Tifa's open to do her combo. Where in this game, you can't, in the DLC, you're Yuffie only. So basically, I would have times where I'm fighting like two enemies, me and Sonon. I would throw my shuriken. I would do the windstorm ability, which does a ton of damage to whatever the shuriken's on. Or then I would start casting in jutsu i would go i would switch my ninjutsu to the element that the enemy was weak to and then all of a sudden i have threat because i've done the most damage and then both these enemies are chasing me so i kind of have to just like backpedal or run away or dodge well, and, and then i'm like sonon mm-hmm. like i'm like i'm sending him commands to do an attack to try to like either stagger the enemy or uh um just deal damage just to finish one off and it works okay but it just feels different than the base game because in the base game at that point i would clearly like switch to someone i'm like all right um 
Yuffie has threat. I need to switch characters because when because your allies in the in the base game and some people criticize this would play a lot more defensively, which actually kind of works if you want to like preserve their HP. Because I'm going to switch over to the other character that has one or two ATB bars and then continue the combo, continue the flow of battle. Where in this game, it feels like I have to instead of being able to switch characters, you kind of have to switch modes. Like, oh, now I'm on the defensive. Now I got a backpedal or dodge roll or whatever. so what I what I ended up doing is I ended up playing Yuffie more long range than than close range. I I used the weapon that she gets that is more magic focused, uh, mm. equipped a bunch of spells, used the ninjutsu. I love the windstorm ability. It's really nice and kind of a fun interaction with her shuriken, and the game has like a, its own version of his of the box breaking mini game from the base game. It's actually kind of yeah. nice because it if you like practice it, it helps you really understand like how Yuffie's uh different combos work and what's effective at close distance and what's effective at range and things like that so it's actually kind of fun and not good at like teaching the intricacies of the combat but it just it just feels slightly different i, I guess yeah I, I was gonna say from that uh i think because I, I, I understand what you mean i think a lot of that is concessions based on the fact that it is just this short sort of episode like when i was playing it i didn't really care about leveling up the materia that much i didn't care about like how many items i had because i knew like None of it would matter too much because it doesn't carry on anywhere. It's not like the base game. Um, and then I found there's this there's that bit where you are just breaking boxes and the game just chucks so many items at you. It's like, yeah, do you want like ten Phoenix Downs? Here you go. And yeah, I, mean, I that saw that bit, too. It, it just kind of basically like they're like removing that resource management from the game. Like we don't care how many high yeah. potions you have. You have eighty now. Like we we don't yeah, want you to yeah, actually yeah. like worry about like consuming this we, we're going to make that mechanic go away i always feel kind of silly when yeah you, like we don't want to balance like how many items we give you we're just going to make sure that you never have to worry about running out until you play hard but that, that's, you again, can't that's use such items. a dlc yeah thing. yeah um but no I, I really enjoyed it it was it was a lot of fun uh bring on part two is all I and I, strug- I struggled I a little mm-hmm. bit at the final boss, which I'm not going to say who it is, because uh, the final boss oh, actually requ- requires you to be very careful about your positioning. Because in a lot of fights in the DLC, if an enemy was like starts charging at you, like, all right, run backwards, dodge, roll away, you know, just be very quick and nimble. Where in the final boss, you have to be very deliberate about, I need to stand here. If I stand there or if I dodge roll in that direction, that will end up penalizing me. So I do really like that. It kind of gives you like a little bit more like restrictions where it's like, all right, you got to be careful here. Like you actually have to use some skill. <laughs> like, ah, oh, damn it, skill. Uh, but it was that. <laughs> It was a it was a good challenge on normal mode. Uh, I feel like if I went through the fight a few more times, I would learn like exactly how to break it open. But th- having to adjust gameplay style my first and second time fighting it, I'm like oh, I get what it's doing here. So it, it was a fun challenge, and I'm I'm probably gonna go through and uh, try it again on hard mode. Uh, but I want to like level up materia and equipment and all that. It was a good time. I know yeah. I kind of opened up talking about how it's a DLC as DLC, which it is kind of, but it's a fun one, I suppose. So it's not it's not shattering. Yeah, any it's, molds, good, it's good but DLC, it's, but, it's good. but it's yeah. No, I agree. That, that that's the weird position you come with this. I think where it's like I, I fought very highly of it. I did really enjoy it, but I just don't have that much to say. Mm-hmm. Um, the other the other big thing I played, I'll I'll leave till last. Cause that's the the thing I'm most excited to talk about. Um, so the other two are just filler, I guess. Uh, Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart. I can't believe I just call Ratchet and Clank filler. I, l- I love Ratchet and Clank so much, but uh, for the for the purposes of this podcast, it's filler for now. Um, Platinum that played on the highest difficulty. Absolutely adored it. Um, I'm really, really like Ratchet and Clank cynical. I I hated the 2016 one story. It really put me off. Like the gameplay was amazing, but the story was cack and. There were so many elements of that that just felt forced. Uh, and then I went into Rift Apart, like, really hopeful, and they nailed it. Like, it is the best one since A Crack in Time, like, hands down. Um, I love the story. Uh, no, I love the characters. Fair, like, all the games since A Crack in Time have had something that's been holding them back quite significantly. So Yeah, I agree. Yeah. But this one is the first one that's felt, like it doesn't weirdly like even like the music which would have been my bugbear like would have been probably the first thing i go uh music's boring this one like the music's really good uh it feels like a really good ps5 showcase it's like quite lengthy i was i got to a certain point and i was like okay so it's near the end now right and it's like no there's like another there's another quarter to go and i was i was pretty happy about that i was gonna Uh, ask you like how long did it how long did it take you to platinum it 
Like, is that 40 <sighs> hours? Is that 70 hours? Is it 30? I don't know. Maybe 20. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. okay, I, I, right. actually, I actually didn't check. Way it might have even been, yeah, it might have even been 15. It, it was it like me to platinum it. Yeah, like to platinum it, it is like just finish the game and do like one or two little side things, which I, this is going to sound like this isn't gatekeeping platinum or anything because like the more people that have them, awesome. But Sony has been doing this lately where it's like most of their games you don't have to 100%, you don't have to do it on a different difficulty level. Um, and that doesn't matter. Platinums and achievements are stupid by design, but as someone who kind of does like to collect them, I, I just kind of wish there was like at least a highest difficulty trophy, just so, just so I felt seen, like my time had been worth it. Definitely um, feels sounds like, like gatekeeping to me. It definitely <laughs> feels like um, recently Sony's been making it so that you can, at least for the first party titles, that you can get the platinum trophy in a single playthrough, which I don't think is yeah, a bad thing. Yeah, so have. But uh, yeah, no, well, no, it's it's it, this this is it. I've, I've, I've considered saying it before, like, oh, I'm going to tweet this. Everyone's going to, everyone's going to love it. And I was like, no, you just sound like a, you sound like a douche for thinking that. But it's not that. It's just, um, like, The Last of Us, for instance. I wish that had had like a. Oh, this is so this is tech, George. This is how you, this is how you make everyone think you're like really good at games. So, <laughs> so like, uh, you just get them pre-release and then show the platinum when you're allowed to. So that's what I did, like, 13 Sentinels last year. It's like, oh, my God, he got the platinum? That's crazy. And then every like, uh, so everyone thought it'd be like, like it was so hard to get the platinum with 13 Sentinels, you know? Sometimes, but it's just sometimes I'm game. like, I totally agree with the general consensus that multiplayer trophies should not be, like, factored into platinums, unless it is a multiplayer-specifically focused game. Like, the game is only multiplayer. Yeah, um, I will agree with that. Um, because uh, my rarest uh, trophies, according to um, according to uh, PSN profiles, are these Wipeout 2048 trophies on Vita that I got that were multiplayer, and the servers for that are offline now. So if you wanted to platinum that game, you just literally can't unless you got the multiplayer that trophies sucks. before the servers wow. down. Yeah, but I, I, do, I think I do me, think that like... the platinum trophy should have like. I'm not saying like you have to do the hardest challenge on the hardest difficulty, but it should have like some degree of like going above and beyond and being like, okay, uh, you're do the do the all the optional like whether it's a side well, quest or a combat simulator or something. I feel like like if you really want to have that like stamp, it's not on the exact. Game, I feel like it's not even exactly our place to say what a game's platinum trophy should have because fundamentally it just comes down to what do the developers want the platinum to symbolize and how do people how do they want people to get it that's true yeah. well i think i'm like probably the wrong person to say about it as well because i'm the sort of idiot who buys collector's edition still and like you know <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, the yeah, like one thing it. i really like about um album for gallery and apparently our album for refrain on ps4 was the same way basically if you get the true ending you get the platinum trophy. Just fulfilling the requirements for the true ending is enough to just have it pop. And I think that's a good well, one, I, like middle ground. I, I, I think it should one. be at least 100% for a game. Like Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart, I think I got to 92%. It was like, there's your platinum. I was like... Oh, yeah. like, does the, the, the game still have an in-game, so like, percentage? Yeah. Oh, yeah. that, yeah, yeah, that yeah, is a bit yeah. incongruent for me. Yeah. Also, That's weird, what I mean. It was just like... Oh. The thing that stood out to me is that there was a few trophies where it was like, okay, get like five gold uh, bolts. And it's like, oh, there's only a trophy for five of them, even though there's 25 in the game. Yep. They're not that hard exactly. to find. And if you wanted no. to, like literally, it, it has that like PS5 feature where it's like, if you want to find out where like something is, here's like a guide, a little video to show you like where it is. I so think the like, worst one is like the um the one for Tales of Vesperia for the Xbox. It's like when trophies and achievements are kind of like a new thing. So this game wants you to do all kinds of stupid tasks, like go a hundred thousand miles with an airship. So you would leave the game on for ten yeah, hours. You'd, 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 ru you would be a, you'd rubber band the control sticks together to just fly in yeah, a circle, right? Over. I mean, they were like stupid trophies, and there would be like. One of them, it's like it wants you to speed run the game and beat it in ten hours. It's like, oh, actually, speaking really of that, cool. um, obviously, it came out recently. Oh, and the near remaster has a trophy for doing it in under fifteen hours, which I think is a carryover from the original release of that game. And I got every trophy in that game because I was, enjoyed it a lot. So I got all the weapons, I did all the other stuff you need, and then the the trophy I was missing was the speed run trophy. And I'm like, I don't really care that much about the platinum to start another file and do the speed run trophy. So I'm gonna call it good there. And then like a month later, Adam was playing through near, and Adam being like, 
an achievement uh unsatisfactory Attic. name here yeah there you go uh he's like i'm gonna do that like so so he did it uh and he's like it only takes nine hours or whatever and i'm like uh, Six yeah, hours. I, can't, I can't be bothered <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I hate speedruns. Anyway, I, I cause this tangent, um, and I'm gonna end it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I've been playing. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not done with Ratchet and Clank. I had to like step away from it because of another game that we're gonna talk about here in a little bit. But I, I, I'm just only like the second planet. The first time you play Rivet, uh, and then I just did the first Clank time section thing. It's it's a really cool game. Like I haven't played a Ratchet game since Tools of Destruction on PS3, and just. Going back into this, I'm just like, it's illegal for like games to look this good. This is crazy. Like, yeah. especially the first like, uh, no lie. When I first like started up this game, I was streaming it to friends on Discord because they were, you know, a lot of them didn't have PS fives and were curious to see what this looked like. It's funny because there's like not a very stream friendly game in the certain in the sense of like bit rate because like the first section is like a big parade, lots of confetti, lots of particles on screen, and it is like it's like I'm sure it looks fucking great, but on the stream it like it looks like a blurry mess sometimes <laughs> because of like it's it's hard to keep up with like that visual fidelity over streaming um and whatnot and but they, they were very impressed with what they saw and like how the 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 gameplay was like like within the first five minutes of me playing it one of the friends on the call just straight up just bought it on the psn right there and then downloaded it and installed it and then just started his playthrough with me there so it's just like <laughs> it's 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 cool. It's, it feels very responsive. I really like the the phantom dash after image thing that you get early on. Then there's wall running, and it just feels so much more mobile than what I remember of Ratchet, Ratchet and Clank, and that's great. Yeah, and it is like you're you're completely right. Like as uh, like 2016 did really evolve some of the movement as well with the jetpack. Well, Rift Apart uh, into the Nexus kind of did that as well, but like Rift Apart is just mechanically the best one it is the best graphics it's the best sounding it is like if it will be in my top 10 of the year like no matter what even if the next 20 games i play i absolutely adore um, it's right, and it's speaking probably of, will be even once i find time to like play it and finish it it has a very good chance even from the yeah. small handful of hours i've played so far um and this is a public apology to returnal uh, which i didn't make time for back when it launched and i kind of went eh not interested. It seems kind of like one note. Uh, Returnal is really, 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 really good. Uh, I absolutely adored it. Uh, I still, I still stand by what I said that the lack of saving is stupid because I was supposed to be seeing like a friend that day, and they're like, "Oh, I'm gonna like start leaving now." And I was like, "No, you can't leave now. I haven't finished this run. I can't turn off my PS5. You don't understand." Um, and that is ridiculous. That is so dumb. Like, I need to put in rest mode. Because apparently that doesn't work. Apparently that can like corrupt it. It's just it's not <laughs> worth the that problem. <laughs> like, I think so. Oh my but God. like either way, I'm not risking it. Like it was a good run, uh, and I actually managed to finish finish the game on that run. So I was like, apologize to the friend. I was like, nah, totally worth it. Wow. Um, but it is, it's it's a shame because I feel like its difficulty, and just the preconceptions of it. Uh, just because it's not from like one of the biggest Sony studios means like a lot of people probably haven't tried it, but like I'd argue in some ways I I've, I've preferred it as a PS5 showcase to than Ratchet, like especially for the dual sense, maybe not for graphics wise, but like the the feeling when you go on like the teleporter, the noise the controller makes, it's literally just like this wobbling alien noise. It's just so cool, uh, and yeah, I just I just I adored it. I couldn't stop thinking about it until I finished it, uh, and I'm annoyed now. But I have finished it because I just want to keep playing it. Uh, it's very similar. This is going to sound like a really weird comparison, but it's it reminds me a lot of Splunky. I guess they're both roguelike, so it's not the weirdest comparison, but in the sense that it's all about learning. Um, and I think I said this about Splunky too, and that came out as well. It's all about like finding out every single thing that worked to your advantage. Uh, and just like when I ran into this gun, there's this gun that you like tag people with. And you create like little triangles of like electric energy and that will like take people out. And that is just the best gun in the game. That is like my favorite gun in a game in ages. Uh, when I figured that out, like started using that everywhere I went, like it just clicked for me. Uh, so Returnal is definitely in the top 10 as well. I, I bloody love that. Have they addressed uh, the, then, uh, I know they kind of gave some like very, not promising anything, but some comments about like looking into implementing some sort of like suspend save thing. Has any of that come to fruition or not really? No, absolutely uh, not. There's 
when I complained about originally, I wasn't admittedly I wasn't far enough into the game to complain. Honestly, like looking back, there are there are like teleporters that can skip you to areas, and there are really the game is split into two halves: one of three different biomes, and then another of three different biomes. So like it's not really six biomes in one. So like six hours, it's more like three or four hours per run. Uh, but it's still a lot of time. Like I've spent more on that in other games, but like I don't know, it just bugged me more with Returnal, and I really think it could it could do with it. Uh, but I guess like now it doesn't matter because I finished it, and there's not really like anything else to do story wise. You can skip all the bosses after you do them once. So, but yeah, that was fantastic. Uh, and speaking of games that absolutely will be fantastic, uh, Neo: The World Ends with You. I've played the demo for that, and woo. It's gonna be so good. I am like, I'm already obsessed with this game. Like, I, I don't know how that's possible, but I, I absolutely adored my time with it. Uh, this is so most positive. A, a little, a little bit of context there. It's just the uh, the final trailer, which I've heard you should probably avoid if you're invested in the story. Came out uh, on Thursday, and then uh, along with the demo, which released yesterday, which does transfer progress to the main game. So, yeah, continue. Yeah, so go. Okay. Go check that out. But um, more importantly, I think, like, not even to talk about Neo for a sec, like, this, the fact that Square Enix has just released a two hour slice of the game, like, just completely for free before the game and even it's, out. And it's like, basically just the opening demo. of the game, right? It's. Yeah, yeah, it's literally just the opening. Um, like, it really sets things up well. Uh, you get a good taste of, like, quite a lot of the mechanics, but not everything. So you could just be like, well, I don't need any more. Um, like you get a really good taste for the the characters and the story, like where everything's going. It's just like I was just really impressed. Like it that this should be the gold standard for how demos are done in the future. I think I know it won't be because you know you got to pre-order to get your two-minute Tony Hawk warehouse level demo. <laughs> but it's props to Square Enix for that straight away. I think that's a really cool move. But this yeah, this I is not a limited time demo, as far as you know, right? This will persist, right? No, no. Yeah, you can just you can just play Which it again. Like, like I probably will play it again. Yeah, the number of times there's been like a limited access demo just seems kind of weird to me. Like someone who grew up in an age where just like demos existed and you could play them and then decide if you want to buy the buy the game. So it's just kind of nice that this will be there on Switch in three years. And if someone is coming to this game late, they can try this demo and decide if they want to go. You know what I mean? Like, feels like that's just like yeah, obvious. Yeah. Like, this is how it should be. <laughs> so cool. Yeah, to see I, I want to. I definitely want to try out this demo. But I, I, I think my fear right now is that I'll play it right now and then forget everything that happened into it uh closer to release which is like the, still pretty far off till july yeah july 20th yeah a month from now yeah uh. so, so that's the thing like i don't want to start this demo and then get done with it and then like fast forward to its release like what happened to this demo how do you play this game again so maybe i'll play mm -hmm. it around maybe a week to a week and a half before the game comes out so it's still relatively fresh in my mind like it's it's hard to hold back but you know, since everything's transferring from the full de uh, from the from the demos to the full game, and it's just the beginning of the game, it's like I have no reason right now to like rush to it um, for for my end. I mean, there's so many other games out right now that you know I can. Uh, that I'm glad that I can just go about it on my own pace right now. Yeah, that's how it should be anyway. Um, but th my main worry, about I think all of our collective, not to speak for everyone, but our collective main worry probably would have been like. Is the combat good? Because the trailers didn't... You, you can't get a taste for combat until you do it yourself, especially yeah. if something like, looks as unique as this. But it's... It, it is very fun. Like It's very fast-paced. It's very, like... The, there's probably going to be a lot of depth, I hope. like It's going to depend like on how the pins evolve. But like just from the demo, like you do... You do get a lot of tools to use. Are you tried on um, PS4 or Switch? The... Uh, PS4. Okay. I'm going to do it on Switch as well. Um, okay. I think I'm going to buy it on both, probably. As like as as you could probably tell, like this is going to be like my little obsession until Psychonauts 2. <laughs> I, I hope I it like does well, because just, like, Square Enix hasn't done the best marketing it. Like, I, I, I feel like Square Enix still hasn't, like as for as exciting as this game is, and having this demo out, they still haven't really done the greatest job just simply marketing it. Like, you think about their E3 presentation, it got, what, 30 seconds, maybe in a montage clip? Mm. Uh, and then it's just like, but it's just so weird that this game is out in a month, and this is the most you're gonna do. Yeah, for I guess now. I guess now that I think about it, they could have announced the demo at their E3 showing, right? So they yeah, announced yeah, it like a. 
we yeah. could have... yeah and then this is they, they could have done so much more to get more eyes and more interest on this game and like hopefully uh, there's still a good chunk of time till the official release and hopefully they get around to doing that but for right now the the western marketing for this game has been very non-existent <laughs> i blame marvel well i leave garden is galaxy alone <laughs> um i the cynical side of me would say they release this demo before launch because i think they know that the people who are going to get this game are already going to get this yeah. game so like why not chuck them the demo because they're going to buy it anyway i don't think this is a move of like oh hey see if you like it like like because if, if you don't know about the world ends of you square enix isn't telling you about it not really um so cynically i think it's like a, a very fan targeted move which i'm fine with because i'm a fan but i do hope it does well uh but like I love the characters. In two hours, I was already like, I just want to, I just want to hear from all of you. I want to like, just, I just want to be there. They're so, they're so well done. Like Cullen's video preview, like did them justice. So the way he described it was exactly how it was. They're so, I, I guess zoomers is probably kind of the word for it. But they're, they're just so energetic. It's oh, such it a different vibe. Yeah, it speaks to me. Oh, <laughs> as a I can't relate. <laughs> to these Jeopardy <laughs> protagonists anymore. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if Brian and I are going to walk in it's like, oh, we feel so out of place and old. What are we going to do? It made but, me feel old. It shouldn't. We're going to turn you to ash and dust as we're playing it. <laughs> we're just degrading. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm so, so excited for it. When when this comes out, like that meme that's like, this is the only thing I'm going to talk about that is going to be me and Neo. Uh, but yeah, I have jabbered on for probably the longest I've ever talked. I have had a full house of games to talk about. I guess that's what happens when we take a couple of weeks out from talking about it. But who would like to go next? Well, I mean, I was able to talk about... Intermission was the main thing that I had played, so I was able to bandwagon off of yours. And then obviously James and Josh had also played Ratchet. So you just kind of served as like the launch pad for a lot of us to talk about games that we had been playing alongside. Uh, but I guess with that said, uh, we'll go over to james who had played ratchet and clank and had a few of the comments when you were talking about it but had also put up a preview for another game that he's been putting some time into yep uh so we uh, got access to monster Hunter stories 2's uh full game early uh once again thanks to capcom for sending code our way uh so the preview embargo lifted earlier this week and uh, i put together both an actual like preview on the site as well as a little video showcasing some of the PC version running at 4K60 max settings, which uh, feel, seems like it was a good decision because I think we are still like Eric's, like which is the big Monster Hunter like content creator on YouTube, put up a PC gameplay footage footage like video too, but it was only 1080p, so I think. My video is the only 4K footage on YouTube right now, I think. That's, oh. that's kind of particular, but also kind of like weird. That's true. I'll take your word for it. Yeah. The sure. weird thing about uh, Monster Hunter Stories 2 is that you say that title, and it's for some reason, like, I feel like they've oversaturated with that, like, with all the trailers that they've shown. Like, we got like three different trailers during that week and a half of E3 at yeah, different places. It's so like, ah, oh, not this game again. But one thing I will say that was my main takeaway from the footage that you've shown is that this might, and um, I, I also had a chance to see some of the Switch footage, which is important to what I'm about to say. Uh, obviously, the PC game, the PC version of the game looks spectacular. It has a great art style. It's colorful. It's fun. But it might also be the best looking Switch game, like period. Like this game is a looker, I think. And I wasn't expecting that for some reason. It like I was watching some PC footage and watching some Switch footage. And obviously the PC footage is it has like a higher shadow resolution, has it's the 60 frames per second, etc. But the Switch footage doesn't look compromised other than the frame rate. Uh, it looks like the best looking Switch game, I think. It might be. I don't know if I'm crazy for thinking that. Is it better than Rise? I think I like the art style a lot more than Rise. Like, I, yeah, just have a more associated look the, the, to Rise. Rise is really good looking though. Like, yeah. Capcom are just they continue so to be wizards, I suppose. <laughs> like, is this, is this on RE engine? I forgot about the engine uh, Stories Two is running uh, on. I don't know what engine it's specifically running on, but I think it might actually be uh, MT Framework. Okay. Oh wow! Just still holding on to that. 
But yeah, tell us tell us about uh, like you know what we can talk about. But obviously, the Monster Hunter stories too. That's looking like at least the PC port is really shaping up to be. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm limited to how much I can talk about the story, and basically, the preview embargo said you can only really talk about the first two chapters of the game. So I'll limit it to that. Um, Mm -hmm. For the most part, within the context of those two chapters, it's a follow-up to Monster Hunter Stories, which I'm well aware that most people probably didn't play. Uh, So they're going to be totally lost, uh, those people. I mean, I'm sure there's like, like let's plays on YouTube and whatnot. And it's but is, like, it, is it like mandatory to like understand the story or was just oh, like, no, no. There, okay. there's, there are a lot of references and it is very much a follow up. It's just like different main cast, but there are returning characters. Um, so there is that. Uh, so I guess the main thing about Monster Hunter Stories is that it is, for lack of a better term, what like a pokemon clone not a not a clone but it's like one of those types of rpgs and i'd say one of those types of rpgs but it's like kid friendly meant to kind of compete against pokemon with a similar sort a similar sort of gameplay style or gameplay loop even if it's not one-to-one it's like and this is gonna sound really bad but i i assure you i don't mean it in a bad way it's like the yokai watch of monster hunter (laughs) Okay, all right. I'm about to say in a vacuum, that sounds like, what did Monster Hunter do to you? I don't, I don't know. People, people enjoy Yokai, Yokai Watch. The people who uh, play Yokai I'll, Watch. I'll, be, sure complete, play Yokai I'll Watch. be completely honest. At least half the reason why I'm saying that is because of the stupid cat that they have as the mascot for stories. <laughs> hey, CD, CD it, loves well, that cat. Leave that I cat mean, alone. He, he's fine, but he definitely looks straight out of Yokai Watch. Like, well, I remember I was watching you play and I was like, why is Meowth here? Yeah. Um, so the way that the gameplay loop kind of works in Monster Hunter Stories is that instead instead of you just hunting monsters, you are a monster rider, where basically you you can still hunt monsters, you still fight them, but what you want to do is you want to go into monster dens and basically steal their eggs and then hatch them into your own little personal army. Dang. That's um, awful. That that sounds tight. <laughs> and it gets even worse because like it's not it's not enough that you find the eggs. It's also like when you're gathering eggs, it's like you have well, one of the really cool things about the game is that when you get a monster egg, it doesn't outright tell you what's in the egg. No, it'll show you like a pattern. So like different types or categories of monster will have different like types of patterns, and then you have to look at the color coding to have a better idea for, okay, so this pattern means it's a flying wyvern, and this color coding means it's probably a Rathian, for example, something like that. And so that's how you figure out which egg is which. And then when you're gathering eggs, your little uh, feline companion will say, hey, that egg seems pretty heavy, or that egg has a really pungent smell. And what that means is is that... um, and you'll also get a hint for this because there's a chance when you're gathering an egg, it'll have like a gold glow or a rainbow glow. And that has a in, an impact on what genes and what g- open gene slots might be available on the bingo board when you hack, hatch an egg. Oh, gotcha. Uh, yeah, in a way, but you can there's you can transfer like genes over from one monster to another using the right of channeling so it's not like for example if you get one of the new royal monster eggs which i'll talk about that in a sec it's kind of a pain in the ass to get those eggs in the first place because what you have to do is that there's these this new feature it, it's in the second chapter so i think i can talk about it so there's this new feature where there's sometimes these monsters that are just sleeping on the overworld that are like really powerful and they're like generally iconic monsters from the series history. So you like you'll have Tigrex or you'll have Monoblos and then the rest of them I can't talk about because those are outside of chapter two. Um, <laughs> you can fight them and they are probably harder than the actual boss monsters for each of those areas. And um, what you want to do is that if you want to get them as a monster or to get an egg for, from them so you can hatch it, you need to hunt them a couple of times so you can unlock their health bar, 
so you can know when it's when it's a good time for you to throw a paintball where if you throw a paintball you have like and if and kill a monster within three turns you have a much higher chance of it retreating to its den and that's how you get the uh eggs for those monsters because otherwise you just can't find them you have to basically force it to retreat that way you can go into the den that it spawns and then you can gather an egg that way so since that's a bit of a pain in the ass, uh, it's a good thing that y if you get a monster with a rainbow gene or the types of genes that you want, you can still just transfer those genes over to a monster that you got from like a rare monster den or from, again, a royal monster den using the uh, right of channeling. So, and it's a lot more in depth than that. And it's a lot of micromanaging if you really want to make super powerful monsters. But it's not really something you necessarily need to focus on if you're just mainlining the story. Because just like in Pokemon. Part, for the most part, the game is fairly easy in the main content. There's some optional side quests where you can hunt like named versions of different monsters that are significantly tougher than uh, anything in that region or you're basically forced to take full advantage of the full combat system it's like oh you better attack that monster with the right uh, attribute attack along with the right monster backing you up and oh it's about to do it's like special attack you better uh better use a trap or something so you don't get insta wiped so it's it's a lot of fun it's a uh, the visuals are really nice. The uh, gameplay is uh, improved from the original game because um, a lot of people have said that Monster Hunter Stories has a bit of a rock, paper, scissors combat. And that's not wrong because you have three different types of attacks. You have technical attacks, speed attacks, and power attacks. And basically, it's a, like a weapon triangle. You want to use an attack that's stronger against the attack that the monster is going to be using. And... Much like in Monster Hunter, there's like rage modes or different ver like different buffs that monsters can have, and that changes up the types of attacks they're doing. So even the first time you're fighting a monster, you have to consider, okay, so what type of monster is this? What type of attack would it lead up with? And what type of attack would it switch to once it goes into rage mode or if it switches into um, its other form, something like that. A good example is there's this monster, Dorombros, which actually hasn't been in the series for a bit. I think the last time you could fight it was in Monster Hunter 3 Ultimate. Maybe it was in Generations. I don't remember. I don't think so. Uh, and it's like a big hulking beast with a, with its main gimmick being that it uses its tail kind of like a, like a uh, shot put ball and it like rotates around. So when you fight it, unlike most monsters, it'll start off using power attacks. And then once it gets angry, it goes into technical attacks because it's really focusing on, like, <laughs> spinning the winning, basically. Mm. So it's, it's a lot of fun. And then you also have three weapon attributes. So in the first game, you only had, like, slashing and blunt force weapons. So you had, like, great sword, sword and shield, hammer, and hunting horn. In this one, now you also have piercing type weapons. So you have a bow and a gun lance. And um, you can equip one of each weapon. I think technically you can equip like as many of the same attributes as you, as you want, but it's in your best interest to have one of each type of damage type. Because monsters, even within the same monster, different parts will have different weak, like uh, weaknesses to different types of weapons. And uh, that's important because sometimes a monster will rear up a special attack and you'll want to break its part before it gets it off so it can cancel the attack or weaken it. And if you use the right type of weapon against that um, part, it'll deal more part damage. So uh, especially for the harder monsters in the side content, it's really important that you uh, match up your uh, weapon with the uh, part that you're uh, damaging or else you're going to be in for a bad time. One of my Sounds favorite, really like, awesome. one of my favorite, like, tried and true RPG mechanics, at least for like turn-based or command-based RPGs, is like having that interlocking system of weaknesses, where you have like a weapon triangle, and then you have like specific types of attacks that monsters are weak to, like blunt, striking, pierce, and like finding out like what combination is going to be the most effective, or if you can't do the most optimal type of attack, what's the what's the next best, and like even. It's a weird comparison, but even Yakuza 7 did that with, like, strike, uh, blunt, and firearms, and then, like, had elemental uh, 
attributes as well. Didn't didn't pull it off the greatest, but just having that sort of thing where it's like you want to try to gear or set up your character such that you have your bases covered. Like I have access to a blunt weapon. I have access to, to a speed attack or whatever. Like I can do anything that any combination of like abilities that I'm, that a monster might be susceptible to. Uh, you know what also has a weapon triangle? The Fort Condor minigame in Intermission. <laughs> you know, And you know what doesn't have a weapon triangle anymore? Fire Emblem for some reason. I miss it. Yeah. But yeah, it's um, Monster Hunter Stories 2, I'd say, really does straddle the line in a good way of being simple enough that if you're still relatively new to RPGs, you'll be able to get into it fine. But there's enough depth here that you you never feel like you're just doing the same thing because you're always running into new monsters that have different patterns. And even outside of like the weapon triangle and the attribute triangle stuff, there will be attacks that monsters do there are just skills or outside of any of the triangle stuff that you'll have to react to for example like anjanath which is the first real boss and i think he's even in the demo so pe- yeah yeah first real boss if you play the demo you'll be able to go up against him i think uh has this one move where if you don't manage to break his nose in time he'll do a like aoe fire breath attack which can cause you to be burned, which means that you also need to deal with like status ailments and stuff like that. And then there's like some monsters that will even seal what type of attacks you or your monster can do, which means that um, if you want to use a power attack against the monster, they can seal that power attack and you need to basically mitigate against that. And does the demo carry over in this one? I believe it does. Cool. But yeah, so obviously you did the uh, both the written preview as well as the video preview of the PC footage up on the site. So I think it looked really nice. Uh, best looking game on Switch, I think. I'm going to stick by that. Uh, I, I'm now, but based on what you said at the start, though, I'm kind of like, should I play the first one? I was always kind of interested in it, but I just never made time for it. But well, I'm not sure. Does the does the iOS version support gamepad controls yet? Because I know that it's on Android and iOS. Well, I one. played. I played through. Uh, mm-hmm. well, what, what was that, Miss Walker RPG? It's. I'm blanking on the title that came out. Fantasian. Oh yeah, I played that on iPhone without. Uh, I played that with a touchscreen, so I can manage. I've done it. I've lived that life. Just like, uh, wait for Windows 11, so you can. Uh, oh yeah. Get, oh, get, but that. Get it through. I, I have <laughs> an. I have an. I have, your computer. An, I have an Apple phone though, so I don't know if. It, People will have to work to figure that out. Can it if, if, if if Monster Hunter Stories is on the Amazon App Store, they can just like get it. And oh, I can just get 11. it on a PC. Oh, yeah. yeah. So there you hopefully, go. Hopefully, yeah. So that was another announcement oh, of the week. Oh, the Windows even, 11 stuff. So hope your hope your <laughs> CPU not is even, <laughs> not three plus yeah, years right. old. Sorry. Yeah, it's tangent. not even the um, just Amazon App Store because they outright said that it'll support side loading. Oh yeah, app, then app key. Yeah. So. So the, the 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 gates are, are open. If you can sideload, you can do anything. My dumb brain was able to figure out how to enable TPM in my BIOS. I'm ready for Windows 11. With that, we'll move on to someone who hasn't had a chance to speak a whole lot yet. I hope he's still awake. Uh, Adam, yeah, hello. I hello. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Damn it! Now I feel bad. That's amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit! <laughs> All right. Okay. I feel bad now. All right, Chaos. I'm going to call you that now. Uh, I I know that you've been putting a lot of time that you've actually, I think you've mentioned it on the podcast pre- uh, previously when we were talking about Final Fantasy XI and you had mentioned all the other MMOs that you had played. Well, the classic version of Aeon, Ion, came out a couple weeks ago and I see that you've been putting time into it. Uh, is that what you want to start off with? Yeah, I guess I'll talk about Ion. Um, was no, it man, Ion? Uh, have you been playing classic version, or do you just go back to the regular version? I, I'm playing classic version. I used okay. to be pretty hardcore with the retail version, but uh, eventually I quit because of some future update that completely ruined the game. Oh, this is for you. You're the you're the primary target audience for this Ion classic. Yeah, um, I wasn't gonna play it, but a bunch of my old like friends that used to play contact me out of the blue they all wanted me to get the band back together yeah basically uh 
I feel it's a massive nostalgia trip. So they're, you know, everyone's just trying to get. How does it, it hold up? How is it holding up? Oh, uh, it's just like how it was before. It's super grindy. Like, I mean, like ultra grindy. <laughs> I mean, I've been playing a week, uh-huh. almost like a week already. Well, not that week. I think four days because it's only been out for four days, right? And I'm only like level eight. <laughs> Hell yeah. Out of what? It, it was, what's the max? 80? Uh, 50. Originally 50. it was 50. It's super grindy, but um, the reason why we love this game a lot is because of the PvP content. It has the best PvP in my opinion. Um, when it first came out years and years ago, that's all I heard about, about this game. Like Besides like the flying uh, aspect of this game, it, it's, it's either like flying or PvP. I never heard about it. Yeah, I, I love the PvP in this game, and none of the other MMOs quite capture it, because it's very... What's the word for it? It's like really brutal. It's like you just get like killed, ambushed. Like there's no rules set apart. You know, you just does, is there like, are there like designated PvP zones or PvP servers? How does uh, how does all those servers are PvP? Because what happened is that uh, you have these zones that you're allowed to PvE, but certain zones that you go to, there would be like these portals that let you go to the other faction side, and you can gank other players. You know. Is that port portal always open, or is it like? Uh, or is no, it... it comes at a certain time, and if you're over a certain level, you can't use the portals anymore. Okay, so, but so like, are there like like hard cutoffs of say like this this portal at this area? You can only be like level nineteen to access it. Uh, More like yeah, it's exactly like that concept. Uh, they locked it to like level thirty. And there's one that's locked around like lower 40 or something like that. And then you can never use those uh, portals again. Um, so people would like try to create alts that would keep around that level. And they would get like the best gear possible so they could uh, like gank people that's within crafty. that level. Right. So when you when you enter a portal and you go over to the other side of it, what are you actually doing? Where, where do you exactly get portaled into? And then like, what do you do there? Uh, it depends on what portal you take. I and mean, like, it, it'll warp you like different areas. And then uh, what you need to do is like, once you get to the other side, you need to purchase a kisk. A kisk is like this little save point that will let you warp back to where you place it. And every time you die, you'll be like, oh yeah, I'll just be back where that kisk is, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the thing is like, I think... Um, was it? it's really it's really easy for enemies to find your kisk and they will destroy it and then you you lose your safe spot because these portals are only open temporary right so you've gotta a lot of roughly yeah uh, about like maybe like an hour okay the game will mention when they're open and you'll see like these portals in the map and i'll be like okay let's take that portal there and try to gank somebody but I, yeah, it has a very good PvP content, and that's are there like permitted ramifications. For. Like, so whatever whatever you're doing at that side, are there permitted ramifications or consequences to the other side if you're like, successful? Uh, if you kill too many players too much, um, you'll start to become marked, and the whole entire world map can see you. Which that's you are. awesome. <laughs> that's like that reminds me of Star Wars Galaxies way back when. I, I never played Star Wars Galaxy, so I can't use that as a reference. Star Wars, huh? you, someone out. chimed for me. <laughs> Dude, uh, I don't, I don't know if you were like alive for this, George, but there was a really cool MMO back then. <laughs> it, it was pretty awesome. But that's how so Before, that was before like the Old Republic, there was Star Wars Galaxies. But then they, but they, also, awesome. but they, also, anyway, ruined, yeah. they also ruined it in like a future update. So, like a Star Wars Galaxies <laughs> classic would be really tempting, <laughs> to be honest. Like, so, what are, we, what are we up to? Sorry, I don't mean to talk over you. I'm just saying, what are we up to? We obviously have WoW Classic, we have Old School RuneScape. And now Ion Classic. I do wonder like how many more of these we'll see. Is, would there be a Terra Classic? I don't know. I, I don't know if Terra ruined their game with future updates. So After I don't know. Bless Unleashed will be a Bless Online Classic. <laughs> uh, <laughs> from the Halcyon days of 2017 or whenever that game came but, out. But like if they could just keep it without introducing like certain stuff they they created it around like version 4.0. Five, I think it's when the game's at its peak. I would say. Is this um, from the original developers and publishers still, or was yeah, it, it is actually, okay. and apparently it's actually one of the top selling games in Korea right now because wow. of classic. Because nobody likes what happened in retail. Do they have the? Do they have some sort of roadmap for this, or are they going to keep it like in a sort of like? I think they. I think from what I heard from from players, they. I think the max update they're just going to go up to like three point zero, and that would be like let's just say it ends at Burning Crusade for a while. Let's say. Oh. because the game's first update was extremely good like the first update just added this new zone and it was more ground focused than the aerial combat because no one liked the aerial combat in this game because you fly for only like a minute 
And every time you like let go of your wings, it's like a 15 second cooldown. So you accidentally push the wrong keys and your wings go off. You just fall off a cliff and you die. And there's, and there's like no auto fly or auto run type of deal. You have to always uh, be holding it down. Basically, there is auto run, but it's not reliable. Your character just runs straight until it hits a wall. Okay. okay. Um, but yeah, like the PvP on Aerial was just no good. Like uh, it was like one of the main selling points of the game when it first came out. They were trying to promote it as like, aerial combat, but in the end, nobody liked it, and it was really poorly balanced. If you were like a melee DPS, it's like it was impossible to kill a ranged unit because they could just keep kiting you. I do kind of yeah. wonder like what NCSoft has plans because they're the publisher of this game, but a lot of their titles are kind of getting long in the tooth. Uh, Blade and Soul, Lineage, Guild Wars 2. Like, I do wonder like when they're going, like, are, are we going to see a Lineage 2 classic? I don't know if I would even... I think there is a I don't, classic I don't, I don't, for Lineage 2. But, and then you heard they ruined it because they added the stuff from the later updates. Because what ruined Ion personally for me was... Um, like round version 4.7, they introduced this item called the tempering solution. It costs you about $5 to buy one drop. And was it if you're lucky enough in the instance, like it, you can find one drop. And what happens if you use this on like accessories, each time you successfully upgrade, you're, you would do like 3% more damage against players. And it just keeps going up and up and up. Just up. In. And this, yeah, this is lineage too, right? Uh, no, this is an ion. This oh, is yeah. a killed ion for me. But the problem is, it's like eventually, if you fail, it's like all your it goes all the way down to zero. So it just adds this moment. <laughs> what is this loop where you just keep buying and buying until you keep going higher? And it fails. Yeah, okay, okay, I got yeah. start over. <laughs> yeah, imagine like uh, what it sounds like. It's like imagine like PSO two weapon upgrades, but uh, you 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 can pay to like upgrade them, and then obviously if you fail to upgrade in uh, PSO two, like it'll. You know, get rid of the upgrades what what he's referring to is the augment system in fantasy star famously has at least fantasy star online 2 has like a percent chance of failing and like down downgrading your weapon but that's that you, the cost there is in-game materials not cash <laughs> yeah so i think that's what ruined the game but like the thing is like ion is also treated as like a wow clone it has a lot of it has a very similar bio system to wow and what can I say? It's like they try to copy like their cataclysm patch because in one of the patches, like the whole world gets destroyed by this dragon, right? And you would lose like half the maps. And they try to streamline. Now you lost level thirty to forty zone, and you just go straight to a level fifty zone. And you're like, okay, so what about the old content? And they're not right, accessible. You're, you're like, right, there, <laughs> uh, while you were talking, I was poking around. Yes, there is already a lineage two classic. So never mind. You can, uh, I take that idea back. It's already been exercised. <laughs> <laughs> but, I don't think yeah, it because everyone just plays lineage, or apparently most of Korea's still just plays the original game. Yeah, if you know, it's like I I know they pretty messed up like the system pretty badly. That the that the classic version is more popular than the retail game, but they're not going to close the retail game because it's more like the whale base. It's where they spend their money on, right? Yeah. No, no, no reason to if they if it's still profitable to an extent. Yeah, like the population's non-existent, but there's like these like few whales that keep the game alive, you know. And I know you've also been putting some time into a uh, slightly more recent MMO, and you you have been uh, kind of like you've been kind of been like threatening this for a couple weeks, and it seems like you finally well tempting us or. You've been mentioning it offhandedly that you had really wanted to get into Final Fantasy XIV. Uh, and I did, you, I did, I did, I did. You finally, I think, made it to a Heaven's Ward. Oh, Heaven's Ward. I made it to Heaven's Ward about you did it. three years later. <laughs> you got you past the, the uh, part that apparently no one really likes that much. You mean the best part? Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, I, I passed the part. Um. I pass uh, a realms reborn. It's not that bad. I mean, I could see the critics. I could see there's a lot of things that could go wrong with it. But I feel like if you don't play it, you just kind of miss out the world building, right? Like it kind of pays. Like, it kind of pays dividends, even though uh, yeah, in the moment it's hard to appreciate. Like there's a lot of things that kind of went wrong. Like there's this one side quest that annoyed the hell out of me. It's like, okay, oh, yeah. like, I think we put little spoilers, right? Like, you, if, like, there was a Titan side quest, it's like, oh, yeah. It's like, you need the approval of these heroes to fight Titan because they defeated him before. So you go, like, do this two-hour fetch quest for them. And I'm like, 
it's a come on you know i was uh, capable of defeating primals it's like why do i have to do fetch quests for like two hours to prove that i can beat it for you you know like come on <laughs> Like, if you really wanted the most out of the world building, you'd play, you should have played FF14 1.0 before it got permanently shut down. <laughs> I know, but nobody has access to yeah, it. When, so when no one Final goes. Fantasy 14 1.0 Classic? I know. Is it nightmare. Yoshi P says it's a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it already exists. It's never coming yeah. back. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah, they already asked Yoshi P about that. That's what he's saying. He just, he just literally, I, I forget who, nightmare. but someone from Easy Allies literally asked him at a fan fest oh. and he said, Nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, be... they could try. I mean, I'm sure there's an audience that you know they there's, pray for it. I'm sure there's an audience, but dear God, I would not. Uh, I wouldn't even wish that on like my my worst enemies if I had any. Like, I, I want to know certain things about 1.0. There's certain information that's really badly archived. Like, if you're playing Final Fantasy 14 right now, there's these grand companies and there's like free commanders or whatever from each grand company and there is only one of them that has like significant wiki info while the other two has like if you know anything about this character please expand our wiki <laughs> it's like it, 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 is, it is kind of like a weird situation because like when an ff14 1.0 came out like youtube still wasn't that big or like just archiving an mmo at that time or just like not really within not, no one was really thinking about it and then it, it would be cool to see someone or somewhere or maybe even the developers themselves like de develop some sort of thing for people that didn't get to experience 1.0 at least get like some sort of database on it because that that feels like it feels like forbidden dark history at at this point it's like it's forbidden some, some way to at least like catalog like what was there rather than just like the snippets and the vestiges of what persists from old youtube videos or whatever yeah, like because I, like I remember, I don't even know if it's still up or if it's, it's probably still an ongoing project. But there's this this Japanese site that that opened up. I want to say maybe two, three years ago. Then their their whole goal was like, hey, we want to take over the scripts from like now discontinued like mobile games just to preserve and archive their stories and like that they existed in history. You know, I, I wish I remember the name of that site, but I was like, that's a pretty cool idea, and I wish more people got on board with that. Because there'll be a day when some of these older MMOs, Ion, Lineage, Guild Wars 2, Final Fantasy 11, well, eventually, they're not going to persist forever. So you kind of hope that at some point we have at least some like good record keeping, some sort of like cataloging of what they were about, what they all contained, because a lot of, you know, love and art and care went into these. So it's kind of one of those... Archiving almost... has gone a lot better than before. Yeah. I mean, back then, people just don't really give a damn, right? And well, it was also, also just side. capability. It was... It was harder to but, record footage, etc. Yeah, so, like, I know, the, but just like in the same Japan side back then, they just don't even keep these info. It's like it's like you look at like game development. A lot of source codes get lost because they never yeah. think of archiving things, right? Who well, who was to be honest, like, right? So between Ion Classic and Final Fantasy fourteen, what is the better MMO? Uh, Final Fantasy fourteen, obviously. Oh, but I was wondering if I was wondering if you throw a curveball, but but the thing is, Final yeah, Fantasy fourteen yeah. doesn't have um. There's a lot of things that Ion kind of pisses like new players off. It's hard to recommend this kind of game for new players. I mean, it's extremely tedious. I mean, I don't have like the quick travel that I would do in Final Fantasy fourteen, right? I have to manually walk to each place, and it's really tedious. So you want to craft? Well, you have to go to this home base on the top. And it'll take you about five minutes to walk there every time you want to do some crafting. Hell yeah. Not to me. It's making All it right. work. You live in that world. This, this sounds like my jam. It's I like, want to be, I yeah, wanna be inconvenienced. Yeah, it's very inconvenient. And all these quality of but life Brian, is missing. You still have like three more expansions of Final Fantasy XI to go through. It's, it's, it's too convenient now. It's, yeah, it's too many. There's. Final Fantasy XI has like eight different ways to warp around now. It's kind of crazy. Like, is this like a this is a, this is a tangent? Sorry, but James invoked this. There's there's been a few times I've been playing that game, which I do plan on getting back to. It's just a really busy time of year. Uh, yep. It's but there's been a few times where I play that game, and it's like, wait, this is another way I can warp around the map. Like, this is number seven or eight. That game has added a lot of different like weird band aid quality of life after the fact. I will never have that uh, vanilla experience. I also forgot to mention the game has two different factions. 
So back then, I used to play as the Ilios, which is like kind of like the angel type side. Uh, this time, I'm playing as the Asmodians, which is like the demon looking kind of side, right? Um, what I find is kind of weird in the Iron Classic is like, okay, I never experienced the Asmodian side as much back then. I find that their story is almost exactly the same, even though they're a different faction. There would be like these quests that, that has the exact same structure as in the Ilio side. Like, there's one of them, it's like where you like, uh, was it this person in the Ilio side will complain that uh, she lost her sword, uh, or not like she lost her sword, uh, she wants you to go to the space to steal the sword. So that she can claim that she defeated these Wait, monsters. Wait, say that again? She wants you to go to space to steal the sword? No, uh, the space. This enemy oh, base. base I heard space. Yeah. And I'm like, wait, what yeah. type of game is this? Dude, <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> All right, I'm in. <laughs> it's like, she wants you to go to this enemy base to steal the sword. While wow, you play the Asmodian side, there's this other guy who has like an exact similar quest structure where he's like, oh yeah, it's like, I lost the sword to this duel to this guy, so can you go there and get the sword back? It's like... <laughs> It's like exact same quest structure with the exact same. I thought they would be like kind of different for each side, but they're like kind of a copy and paste on both sides with a similar quest structure. You know what I'm saying? Well, yeah, I'm guessing they had designed that base and the, whatever you have to do to, to f- fulfill that quest. And they kind of wanted to make use of it in both both versions, I suppose. And I've never yeah. played WoW, but it sounds like maybe this is their implementation of a alliance horde sort of thing different, yeah yeah different. they do have a they have basically the exact same thing like the structure of uh alliance and horde but i just expect like their store be like wildly different from each side but they had the exact same thing i mean like um in the ilio side there would be this area you go to and it becomes a desert later on because all the trees are dying and this one in the snow area it, for the asmodian side it's the exact same story there's these trees are dying because of these spirits are cursing the land it's the exact same structure i mean i was like oh man i'm it's guessing like, that co- again comes down to this is me speculating based on your little 10 second recollection but i'm guessing that's just because they had designed that and they want to basically make use of it through both story arcs so they just kind of like frame it in a slightly different way and be like it's different it's not the same game it's, or it's not the same content Anyways, yeah, I just was expecting a wildly different experience by playing the different faction, but I don't know. But is WoW the same thing? If anyone played WoW, where the Horde and the Alliance basically had the exact same quest structures? I'm going to take that as no one here has played WoW. At least <laughs> not enough of it to, to know the answer. Oh, rip. Uh, I, need, I, I need WoW Classic then, Classic. Every now and then I get interested in maybe trying WoW, but then every time I do, I just hear, like, I look at the wow player base and every single one of them seems absolutely miserable with the state of the game right now and it's like okay i'm good (laughs) yeah i haven't heard positive things about the game recently so the warlords of draenor like i think is the last time i heard decent stuff from wow i I don't know maybe legion actually yeah it was legion people didn't Uh, like Warlords of draenor (laughs) oh i gotcha but yeah, thanks, uh, Chaos, for bringing some chaos to the podcast. I don't know uh, what other opportunity we'd have to talk about Ion Classic. So, yeah, no one, no one's into this game. It's <laughs> for me, right? No, I, I know way more about Ion <laughs> now than I did 20 minutes ago. So I am learning. And now I have to like awkwardly be like, okay, so that other thing I was trying to segue into. Uh, I feel I still feel bad about that. Adam, are you still around? Are you here? I'm here. I am tired. Hello. Me too. I have coffee. Hello. Um you have been playing a few games that don't really overlap with anything else that anyone's played. Well, actually, I take that back. There's one game that you I know put a lot of time into that also Josh has put a lot of time into that is a recent release. Uh I guess I'll let you introduce it. So, what have you been playing? Yeah, so it's not very often, I feel like, these days we get a game, an RPG from a, an established Japanese studio that's a brand new IP that's got a pretty big budget behind it. So when you know Bandai Namco uh, announced Scarlet Nexus last year, at first I wasn't like that interested in it, but then I just sort of, I don't know, um, I've kind of over the last couple of years have had like a brand fatigue, how everything has to be in like a continuity or a universe, or this is connected to that, or 
or whatever. And I'm like, you know what? This is something that's like brand new, completely new. It's not, um, it's got a budget to it. So it's not, you know, because indie stuff, there's new stuff in the indie sphere, every, well, you know, everywhere, of course. Um, so, but in terms of like on this scale from a, a studio like Bandai Namco, you don't see that too often, I feel. So, you know, as we approach release on this game, I got more and more interested in it. Like, hey, this is something that has no established lore or connections or anything like that. It's something new. So I, I, I wanted to try it out. And a few of us on the site were actually able to play this game early. Uh, I'll just shout out our review was written by Colin Black, uh, which is up on the site. And then Josh here in, the, here in our podcast also played through it as well. So we'll probably bounce off of each other here as we discuss it. So just as a broad overview, Scarlet Nexus is an action RPG with an anime aesthetic um, from Bandai Namco. It just released like yesterday um, for basically the uh, PlayStation, Xbox platforms and PC. And in this game, you have two different playable protagonists, Yuito and Kasane. So you pick which story you want to play, and then you basically go through their story it's an action rpg like i said so real time it's it's almost like uh i i, I hesitate to say character action game but it's kind of like a hints of that it, it um, reminds me of like when they when they did code vein like code vein is uh clearly inspired by dark souls or that souls yeah. more like you know this is definitely inspired more in the devil may cry sphere but i think it does a way better job with its atmosphere and characters than code vein did uh, and yeah uh, um, so first things first is that uh, this the Bonnie Namco had quite a bit of restraint when they were advertising this game. They did release a lot of trailers for it, but even then, um, unlike when we talked about earlier, to, like the 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 World Ends with You trailer that they released from that Square Enix released is a bit spoilery or or whatever. Um, there's a lot that. Bonnie Namco has not like hinted at or teased at or re- revealed outright, of course, for like what happens in Scarlet Nexus. Don't worry, we won't spoil it here. But I just wanted to mention that like this story goes places that like I didn't expect it to go because like there was no hints that it was going to do these sorts of things in terms of the storyline. And so what I'm getting at is that there's a lot that can be spoiled, but we're going to try our best not to. So it's a very twisty storyline. There's a lot that happens. Um, it actually is a little bit convoluted, but I do think it kind of comes together in the end. It just it does take a bit to get there because it's a little bit um, complex. But yeah. in any case, cause it's, it's, it's the type of game where, um, anyways, I played as Yuito first. I kind of felt like he was sort of like, he was the first revealed protagonist. I'm like, okay, maybe his story was the one you should do first. And then Kasane, who's the other protagonist, I can like, like fills in gaps. But I will admit, like, for the first half, let's say, roughly half of Yuito's storyline, there are a lot of mysteries and a lot of things you don't really know what's going on yet. And you kind of just have to be patient in terms of uh, eventually it will make sense. But there's a lot of mysteries that are layered on early on that it is admittedly a little bit tedious, but that's just sort of how the game works. I do think Kasane's story is maybe a little bit better at like dishing out, you know, explanations or story beats and things like that early on. Plus, she has a little bit of a better uh, motivation early on, I think, a more distinct one. So I think actually it might have been better to start with her, which is actually what I've been recommending people do. But it, it really, to get like the full picture of everything, you do have to play both storylines because certain it's the same story. But it's different perspective. Yeah, the very basic premise of the game out the bat, uh, whether you're Yuito or Kasane, is that uh, you're you know, part of this organization now called the OSF. I forgot what it stands for, to be honest. Others Suppression Force. Oh, thank you. Um, so you're part of this military organization, and there are these uh, alien-like creatures called the Others that you know uh, uh, sometimes, often, you know, cause trouble in in places you have to go and like kind of make sure that they're being dealt with. And the, the others are sort of like this uh, otherworldly type creatures. They, they remind me uh, a little bit of like Silent Hill when it comes to like the way they're presented, the way they move. It's very jerky. It's kind of almost, they're kind of uh, like out of a horror movie. They're uh, unsettling. Yeah. And then, so very early on, the the city that you're in, in Suo, uh, gets attacked by the others. 
and uh, that's when Yuito and Kasane like first meet because uh, Yuito and his buddy Nagi uh, they see a, a civilian uh, getting attacked and then they're like oh we're only cadets we're not supposed to fight them yet but Yuito's like look someone's gonna get hurt or uh, if, if we don't do something so they get themselves in a bind and then um, Kasane and uh, Naomi her sister uh, show up and then that's kind of their first meeting and from there there are they, they kind of their platoons that they're part of kind of uh, intertwine with one another because they're all kind of new at this along with some older veteran members so they're kind of going through this training together and then you know as the story progresses it goes to places and then you start finding out that like there are definitely there's more to the eye that, that you can see at first and I think it's I, I beat Yuito's route. Uh, Adam has beaten both routes, but I, I started with Yuito. I'm a, a, a good bit into Kasane. And it's really cool to see like re- revelations that happen from the other side because they're very, they're, like, their perspectives are very much like other side of the coin, but there are definitely like times throughout the so- story where they diverge and then there'll be like entire plot threads that like you won't see because you're uh, you're not playing the right character. You're they're only like, there are characters and there are entire like storylines that like you won't really know how they resolve fully until you play that other side because they obviously diverge at some point. And I think if you only play, if you only play one storyline and you like think, well, that plot thread is dropped. It's like, chances are probably not. It was probably in the other perspective and you just missed it or haven't seen it yet. Yeah. Uh, And it's, uh, I think the, the, the thing that, it's sort of a bummer, but I get it why they did this to obviously save money. Um, because this game, ha- like, uh, let me just get it off the bat. Like, this game is probably in, like in the running for like one of the best looking games this year. Oddly enough, it has such like a very clean, self shaded look, especially to its character models and animations. Uh, that like I was very impressed. But at the at the cost of this, uh, uh, most cutscenes of the game are presented through like vignettes. They're they're stills. That still use the in-game character models, so there's like visual attachments you can put on characters, like in the Tales of games that'll show up in these vignettes, which make them look goofy, but kind of betrays the serious nature of the story. But they, you know, they they talk to each other in these vignettes. They kind of have like these still images with their mouths moving, so it's a little bit kind of weird at times. But then there there'll be like a few scenes where it's like fully in motion in engine, things are happening in that scene, and like those are like the most like powerful scenes of the game because they really yeah. show off like the graphical prowess of this game so i get why they couldn't do that whole game like this because it would be insanely (laughs) expensive there's a lot of uh, just just as something that's like popped into my head from Uh how the environments are they still quite like bland because like i i said i loved the the characters but like the environments were just i think the environments like technically look impressive in terms of like visual fidelity but they are they are a lot it is a lot of urban environments a lot of like you know streets and buildings and things like that there are Mm -hmm. there's like one or two more varied environments later in the game but the variety is perhaps a little bit um low in the environments because they are there's there's like four or five different ones that are like different variations of like buildings and concrete and streets and yeah walls. there are there are la- there are later areas and like even like another if, if you're from you if you're playing yuto and then there, there like there's like another town that like you really don't miss out you miss out on but that like that other town or other city is like looks pretty good there's like a, a later area in the game that looks like Way, way more different than what you're used to in the like the first half of his route. That like it, there are times where it's like, oh, this looks really nice, but for the most part, like yeah, it's a lot of urban environments. And I think the the weird missed opportunity. I hope you know, uh, uh, is like there's like no day night cycle in this game because the, this game also has uh, an anime adaptation that's starting to air in July. But there's the first two episodes are out on, I think the the Funimation channel or whatnot. I th- on the YouTube, I think on the Funimation yeah. YouTube, as a sneak peek. But like, if you remember the the tutorial scene, uh, or not even the tutorial, but the early cutscene, uh, after you um, go through the first few fights in the game, and then the crows, the press comes out in their drones, and then uh, Luca, another character in the game, has to like uh, teleport uh, Nagi, Yuito, Kasane, and Naomi out of there to like kind of hide under the press eyes because like cadets aren't supposed to be fighting others. Um, that scene in the game and that whole fight like takes place at night. So it's like it, it took me a while. It's like, oh, okay, it's this scene, but it's just a different time of day. While in the game, it's always like static weather system yeah. or a static environment. 
All right, so let's let's uh, transfer to gameplay. So, yeah. like we mentioned earlier, it's kind of character action. So, basically, for both Yuito and Kasane, they are different, but just commonality between the two. You basically are switching between your physical attacks with your weapon uh, and your psychokinesis attacks. So, every member of this OSF. Um, they have different like magical psychic abilities. So some characters have like pyrokinesis, some have electricity, some have teleportation. Um, your main characters have psychokinesis, so lifting stuff up with their minds, right? And I believe actually the the uh, director told me that in an interview that this one of their inspirations for this was what was it that old anime Cyborg Zero Nine was 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 one of their was one of their inspirations yeah. for it? <laughs> yeah, interesting. Yeah. Anyways. Uh, so your battle style, you basically have a cadence between using your physical attacks and then every once in a while basically grabbing a nearby object with one of the triggers and with psychokinesis throwing it at an enemy. And you can't just keep throwing items you know, endlessly because that takes up part of your like psi bar or whatever it's called, your like, psychokinesis mana bar. So that actually fills by doing your regular attacks. So that's why you kind of have to have this balance of like do some regular attack combos and then throw in a, a psycho, a kinesis like slam, like an item slam. And that's broadly the basis of things with the combat uh, at the very basic level. And different objects that you can pick up do have like um, different amounts of damage. Like you can pick up things as large as like cars, which will do more damage, but take maybe a little longer to throw. And then like things like trash cans that don't take do as much damage, but you can throw them a little quicker. Then, in addition to this, there is like a linking system with the other characters in the game. So you have, you can have like a squad of two people, two other characters that are actually in battle beside you. Like they kind of just act on their own because you only play as Yuito or Kasane. So you have these two other characters in battle with you, and then you can have more characters kind of in your reserve. But any one of them, you can actually have be linked to them and borrow their power. For example, Hanabi, she is one of the characters that teams up with Yuito, and she has pyrokinesis, so flames. So you can actually link up with her uh, at the touch of a button, effectively, to add fire attacks to both your physical and your psychokinesis attacks. And just as you would expect, certain enemies are maybe more vulnerable to fire, and if you get enough fire attacks in our row, they'll start to be, you know, they'll get, they'll catch on fire and start burning and take damage over time. There's also other abilities that you can link up that are maybe not as obvious, like uh, Sugumi as clairvoyance, which changes like how you can dodge enemy attacks uh, and do more like perfect dodges, which you can uh, exploit for 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 more hits and higher damage. There's a, there's another character, like I said, with electricity. There's a character that has hyper velocity, so you basically slow down time when you link with them. So and then, and it's all like eventually you'll be able to like uh, mix them as well because this game yeah, has a skill tree system. One. Yeah, so this game has like a a skill tree system both for Yuito and Kasane. And then as you level up, you gain more skill points. And then one one of the pips on those skill trees is like, hey, you can activate uh, two of these borrowed abilities simultaneously. And then there's a, another pip that says, hey, you can do four simultaneously. So you can start mixing stuff. Like say you have a character a Kyoka. Who has like duplication so that means anytime you throw something it'll throw double of what you're throwing so you're throwing a card and it'll throw two cards at them so and then you start thinking about okay what if i mix this with like electricity so you activate kyoko and then she then like electric dude and i like then, how you said duplication electricity because that's like one of the best combinations in the game uh-huh and then so now if you activate both of them you're uh, you're borrowing both their abilities so now that modifies it so when you're throwing like this car it's not only like double this car, but now they're all they're they're both electrified, and then that just really melts enemies. Well, like uh, when when that happens, and then obviously since it can go up to four, you can start mixing and matching different things. As you, yeah, it's it gets it the battle setup gets pretty crazy. It does a pretty good job. Like I know a lot of people who tried out the demo and like I don't know about this battle system. It feels too overwhelming. It's obviously it's a vertical slice, so like you're still you still don't have your bearings. But uh, the game does a pretty good job easing you into the battle system step by step, so it doesn't feel like too overwhelming at first. But like you know, by the later half of the game, when you finally start getting used to all your abilities and tools at your disposal, 
it really shines in that aspect of like mixing and matching your different abilities along with your psychokinesis attacks. And then there are also other options that uh, unlock as you do like the social link equivalent with your party members. Like these are bond episodes. So as you get to know your party, uh, party members and like see these bond episodes, you'll start unlocking different abilities. Like, hey, instead of like only using or borrowing their abilities, you can actually spend that uh, bar on uh, swapping you out very temporarily with them so they do an attack. So instead of like borrowing Hanabi's fire ability, I can instead use her ability to swap out Yuito with Hanabi and then she'll do an attack like with her fire staff. It's like a wide AoE attack. And then that does a lot of like damage on its own as well. So this is, comes into fruition for like um, party members that have more situational um, SAS abilities like invisibility or uh, clairvoyance. You're not going to be using those every battle. But if you have, uh, if you did the bond episodes with those characters, instead you can now still use their abilities uh, where they just swap out and do that attack instead. So even though. Their abilities may not be useful to you at the moment. They can still attack for you. So you're st- there's still example, more, and more options. Yeah, tell me if you agree with this. But like for example, Kagero's ability is invisibility, and there are some enemies that the invisibility is useful for, but it's not as like broadly useful as like duplication. However, Kagero's like they call it his combo vision. That's when you basically just have them do an attack. His combo vision is actually like really useful at like filling up the crush gauge, which we haven't talked about yet. Mm-hmm. Um, so just it's worth like, well, if you're not if you're not linking with him, you might as well just throw him in and do his combo vision every once in a while to to have him you know come in and do some damage because it's pretty useful. Um, yeah, on its own. So this is just a minor element. Well, it's not really a minor element, but it doesn't take much explanation. Is that every enemy you fight has HP, of course, but they also have like. Uh, I forget what they call it exactly. It's like a stamina bar. It's like the crush crush gauge. The crush gauge. And so there are some enemies that have a lot of health. And if you were just to try to whittle their health down to zero, it might actually take a while. However, all enemies also have like a crush gauge. It's like a stagger bar, like I said, where if you can get that down to zero instead, you can perform basically a finisher on the enemy and take them out instantly. So... When, as you get used to the game, you kind of get familiar with the enemies and also familiar with your character abilities, like your various, what your various links and bonds and combo visions and things like that can do. You, there might be certain enemies like, oh, these, I know like, for example, these winnery enemies, these are like, they're like these big, like, they're like big monst- monstrous, like deer or something like that, right? Yeah, they're, they're, with, they're, they're almost the equivalent of like tremors. Uh, you remember those yeah. movies? Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, like, those enemies have quite a bit of health, but if you are careful in how you're attacking them, and, like, one of them, for example, their weak spot is their rear legs, and you, if you go for that section of the body, um, you, can fill, you can lower their crush gauge much more quickly than you can lower their HP and then do a finisher on them. And that's a much more effective way to fight than just, like, whittling down their HP. You're, you're making it harder on yourself if, you, if that's all you're doing. So that's also something that I think this game does pretty well by the end is like when you're encountering different enemies, you you become familiar with, oh, these Santa enemies, the enemies have fun names. Uh, I know what I need to do to get their crush gauge down quickly so I can take them out quickly. Like, oh, and this is a, uh, the, I forget what the crocs are called, the, the crocodile enemies. Like, oh, oh this yeah. Is the crocodiles, I know what to do here. And you kind of learn like different enemies, like the best way to take them out. And it, and it might it might require both a targeting a certain spot of the body as well as using like a certain ability like some enemies are more susceptible to fire or electricity or some some enemies are better to like use your really focused on using your psychokinesis on them so it's actually kind of funny that i think this game uh they they heavily advertised it as being quote from the team behind tales of Vesperia. now I don't know, like specifically, like how much of the team here worked on Vesperia more than a decade ago, but I find that I find that comparison actually kind of funny because Vesperia, while it's a different sort of game, I also feel like it's also the sort of game that took it takes a while to like kind of grow into itself in terms of the mechanics that the game gives you in terms of the uh, what you are able to do and like how the game plays in the first five hours is pretty different to how the game plays like when you're in like nearing the end right yeah and i feel like 
Scarlet Nexus is similar. Like it takes a while once you start to fill out that brain map, that skill tree, and once you um, bond with your teammates and unlock more skills with them, and also just getting familiar with the game too, right? It, it really grows into itself. So it, if you're if you're playing it like just starting out and you're kind of feeling like I don't, I just, I'm not really gelling with this yet, um, give it some time and it it will uh, evolve a bit anyway. So it's it's that sort of game. I think that's a, that's one of the the weaknesses, uh, early game weaknesses of the game is like they they really gate off basic like mobili- mobility mm-hmm. options and maneuverability maneuverability options. No double jump. Uh, uh yeah, you have to unlock double jump. You have to like it, the, the 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 Okizemi, the um the when you get knocked down and then uh, go go like oh, flip yeah. back up again. Like it feels super awful like in the first hour of the game, like when you don't have that ability because you just get knocked down by an enemy if you get hit and you're just there laying on the ground, you can't do anything because you haven't unlocked that ability yet. Uh luckily it's like one of the first abilities you have you can gain access to, but it it, it does no. really <laughs> take you off. Um like that but in general like the the skill tree is pretty good like you know they really has a lot of really handy abilities for you to get um you know and, and you can go uh, several different ways like you can extend the co- like uh the combo of your basic attack you can uh do more aerial attacks or more aerial options that's a really p- pretty big distinction between yuito and kasane where um kasane really really shines in aerial combat while Yuito is more of a grounded um, character, he mm-hmm. attacks with a sword, so he's more melee focused. While Kasane has like floating knives that she flings out, so she's more of a mid range fighter. So, and then uh, Yuito never gains access to two back dash or aerial dashes, but Kasane has the option to get two aerial dashes. Um, also, comparing the two characters, this is exactly where I was going to go. Um, this sort of makes sense. Like, this is what I would have expected them to do. Because uh, Yuito, so each character has basically like a strength stat for their for their physical hits and like a power stat for their whatever their magic is, right? So Yuito's strength stat is significantly higher than Kasane. So for like using your physical weapon on enemies, Yuito, you can get by pretty well just using his sword and just like the occasional psychokinesis throw, right? Um, Kasane is quite a bit weaker than Yuito when she comes to using her like knives. So if you're just sticking to using her knives, it might feel like, man, enemies take a while to take down. But that's because she's much stronger with her psychokinesis. So I feel like Kasane is actually like a little bit, just a bit, more like an advanced character because um, you have to rely on her uh, psychokinesis abilities to really do damage. They do a lot of damage, like I said, more than Yuito's, but you you kind of have to realize that and... You use her knives to kind of whittle down enemies to fill up her bar, and then that's when you can start throwing, you know, objects with her psychokinesis and really do damage. So that's kind of how the two characters differ, in, like, broadly in terms of their play style. Yuito, you can really kind of just focus on using combos with his sword, and Kasane really focusing on, like, how to most effectively use her psychokinesis. Um, plus, of course, like, the range that they attack at is different and whatnot, too. So, but... There, it is pretty different between the two and how they play. Yeah. I, I think the the thing that really um, impressed me, oddly enough, was there was the little details in the game, especially when you get to the when you get to the hideout and you start giving more gifts to oh, yeah. your um, allies because you know when you do gifts, you, you improve the relationship with them. You might get a, like a bond episode uh, to expand their abilities and whatnot. But uh, like every gift that you give them, they have this own little section that they they hang out with the hideout the kind of like the the uh, let's say for sugumi she's like raising a sort of like a mini garden in like her area like the hideout so she's always at her desk like researching and whatnot and every gift that you give her it's kind of expanding expanding that area out so everyone has like has their own little like cove of like just uh just a mess of things that you've that you've given them that they're just like you they interact with it uh in really fun ways either they're on display or like they actually interact with the gifts that you give them and like it kind of gives a little bit more life to the game like the, mm-hmm. for this game i didn't really care about the characters like the final stretch and i feel like it really earned like that like sort of like um what's the word it it, it sort of earned my respect for the for the game and its characters by the end it's like oh they they really it really does come together it really feels like a team that like you care about there are actual um for most of them, at least, there are actual like stakes involved, and the, their um, involvement with the story feels justified for a good show of them. 
And and let me just the, expand know. on that broadly. Um, mm -hmm. So the hideout is sort of like your base, and you'll actually probably end up going there very frequently. And like Josh was saying, when you give gifts to characters, that basically adds to that character's like set, literally like their set of animations that they could possibly have when you visit the hideout. And it's just kind of a nice touch of flavor. Like rather than just going to the hideout frequently and like every character is always just in the same spot, just sitting in the same chair or whatever. Like by the time you're at the end of the game, and I think each character has like 10 gifts you can give them. Each time you go to the hideout, they they're like they might be interacting with a different object that you've given them. Like Sugumi, who's the plant girl, she might be at her computer. She might be watering. Uh, she might be interacting with Kagero, who, who kind of stands next to her. Um, or like there's Kiyoka, who is the person with duplication. Like sometimes she's like at her little corner. Sometimes she's 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 got duplication. So sometimes she's like giving herself a massage. It's uh, a, those, those are great. Like the first time I saw yeah. Kiyoka, it's like, oh, she's like, wait, there's two Kiyoka. Oh, okay. She's using yeah. a duplication to like do her hair. That's really funny. Yeah. <laughs> and so it, it's just like a cool little touch that because you go to the hideout so frequently that it's nice that there's like such a variety of different animations that the characters might be doing that, if you know, it, it's not just like, it feels alive rather than just like, a gamey like oh here's all the characters standing in a row or something like they're always so I'm, I'm, I'm gonna chime in here but one of my favorites that i saw people sharing screenshots of like one of the characters was just like completely laid out on top of one of like a giant like carnival plush or yeah. something like that so <laughs> yeah like you, you give you give one of the characters yeah like a, it's like a one of those it's like a big with like one of those giant teddy bears only it's a game mascot and they just like plop right on top of it um they're a pretty so a character too um, so it's kind of funny to see that, but um, yeah, it's just it's just like a really fun touch of color um, yeah. flavor for the game. Uh, uh, and I don't know if you noticed this, Josh, but like the gifts in each playthrough are unique. Yes. So when you start your second playthrough, all of your gifts from your first playthrough are still there, and then you're like literally just adding more. Um, so you it, by the end, it's like a it's honestly it's a little bit like a mess. There's just so much in that hideout that that people can interact with. Um, it's been add a lot it's of so it's so you know, funny it, 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 like by the end like the hideout looks like like the aftermath of like some sort of like party you went to <laughs> yep. it's it's really funny i think what also one of the the things that really stood out to me is like the the uh ost for the game the, the music in this game is uh, it honestly surprised me there was a lot of really really good tracks in this game i think one of my favorite tracks is like for like one of the very big early story revelation scenes where yuito like there's like a certain boss fight that happens and like it 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 it's a very creepy track. It's a very in the context of that boss, it's very creepy what's happening. So it feels it's like there's like a horror vibe, an intense horror mm -hmm. vibe to that whole thing. And it's it it's honestly one of my favorite encounters in the game. Like there's so, there there are things that happen, you're like, oh my god, what the fuck is happening? And there's like and that the whole creepiness to the, to it is so good. And and the, and there's a dynamic soundtrack too. So there's another system the game called brain drive and this is like a, just a gauge that fills up as you're fighting and it'll automatically activate and like um like enhance your abilities and like your psycho and reduce how much uh psychokinesis mp you're using for attacks and whatnot and you can ex obviously expand on this uh on the brain map uh once you once you unlock it but the the music distorts into like a more like dubstep type of like mm -hmm. vibe to it as you as you uh, as that activates so it's really funny like how lively the, the ost is for this game too it's it goes it's so varied and it's so refreshing like I, I i haven't felt this enthusiastic for like a brand new ip out of nowhere in a while because i'm just like by the end of it i just felt good i was like dang this is this is a really impressive thing that they made it sure it has its flaws like all the side quests suck they're all like yes. fetch quests I was, I was actually just about to say like yeah the things that this game does not do well honestly the side quests are like it's like um, i don't want to say garbage <laughs> but they're they're the side quest it's very like, so half-assed like <laughs> we should have side quests so let's throw in side quests right and they're just completely checklisty no worth then you're getting worthless stuff it's like any any of the awards you get from side quests you can buy and it's not they're not like story-based side quests at all it's literally tasks to do they're just bad they don't add anything to the story at all like not at all like, yeah. yeah like a, like it'd be like random osf soldiers or random people it's like oh yeah like can you get me like three of this consumable item that you already have 
thanks or hey you know there's a thing over there you want to like beat up an enemy using this like three times it's like please go do that okay and then here's your reward like a weapon that you already have that's like cool yeah. thanks <laughs> I guess. And also, the, the I would say the bigger like issue with the game because side quests you can just ignore if you decide yeah. you don't like them. But a bigger issue with the game is that you do backtrack through environments fairly frequently. Mm-hmm. Like if early on in the game, you go through like an abandoned city called is it Kikuchiba? Yes. And you end up going back there like four or five more if you do quests like times, and it's just kind of like I'm going through this area again really and then you also go through the uh like the construction zone three or four times um and even even like some of the later game areas like uh, arahabaki which that doesn't mean anything if you haven't played the game but uh you go through some of the later areas some of them you only go through once but even still like josh is there really a whole lot of difference between like the Harab- Arhabaki dungeon and the like to get to dungeon like they're they're pretty similar. Oh, yeah, um, they're pretty. Yeah, they're pretty. It, it, so that, that's that. like mm-hmm. yeah, that's that's probably like if I had to lay, name one thing as the biggest weakness of the game is the sort of environment reuse and also not just reuse but like some of the environments just kind of work similarly to the other anyway, um, even if they're not technically the exact same. So it's just it, kinda, it also it also doesn't help that like. There, uh, there are like environments throughout, like the or there are areas throughout the, like the stages where you don't have access to, it. like say you you don't have Luca yet because Luca has the power of teleportation. So that means you can like go through like previously inaccessible areas in previous areas. But like the things you find behind that are like totally not worth it. It's just like yeah. oh, it's just uh, it's already uh, a consumable that I already have that I'm already maxed out on. I don't need this. Or yeah, I, I'm going to hesitate to say this, but there, there, at first it almost feels like there's like going to be like a Metroid style, like, oh, here is a door that you open with electricity. I don't have the electricity character yet, so I bet I come back here once I have them so I can open this door and get something good, right? And it's not like that at all. Like you open yeah. the door and it's like, sometimes there's literally nothing and sometimes it's like a potion. Like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But but I think um, but you know I if they decide I hopefully I'm really hoping this game does well if they decide to like make a sequel there are, there's enough room for improvement that you can really make like a really crazy good like sequel out of this game and like be just forever remembered you know <laughs> that, that there are avenues uh, you know on where this game leaves off like uh, where where they would take it would make sense and would be very exciting if they decide to explore it so. Yeah, it's... I think we kind of touched on the broad strokes. Is there anything from the play- from the members in this cast that haven't played that you're like wondering about? I kind of just feel like I think I have also maybe not as vocally as you, but I've also been on the record saying like I don't like when games are so intertwined and designed to be MCU style things where they're like cross pollinate like media and everything's got to be interconnected. And this is something that stands alone. Everything on it is original and created bespoke for this game Mm -hmm. that I just feel like I really need to like set aside time for it. I don't know. That's that's my main thing. It's actually not that long either. Um, A a single character playthrough, (laughs) a single character playthrough is about 25 hours more. Like I was around 30 ish when I did all the quests and like boosting all the, I did uh, and whatnot. My, my, my was like about twenty two on, on mine, but you know some people have gone twenty. But it, it, it it's one of those things. Is like you think side quests are worth it at first until you realize no, they aren't at all. Well, like, okay, one thing yeah. that but I was actually like, starting yeah, to yeah, wonder cool. was it seems like it's always an easy criticism to say, or maybe not easy, but common that side quests they're very easy to criticize because I don't know if that they're just typically bad or people expect more or our expectations are misaligned. Like maybe this is a tangent that I don't want to get into like on this cast, but like what is a game with good side quests? Because I feel like Final Fantasy VII Remake, great game with bad side Witcher quests. 3. This, uh, yeah, Witcher. Like, and but then like I would like to see like what makes Witcher Three side quests so good. Another game that I actually think has really good side quests this is a bit of a oddball. Is Mankind Divided? Uh, Mankind Divided. Yes. Deus Ex yeah. has really because yeah. that game basically only has 
10 Ten. side quests uh, yep. for that game. And it's like each one is its own independent story, right. which has different locations, different, like it's none of them are just tasks. And I kind of feel like that's the direction I wish more games did where it's like this game, wow. like imagine Scarlet Nexus and Bizarro World that has three side quests and each one only involves like a handful of characters, but it's actually like got a beginning, middle, end, like has like, you know, some sort of self-containment or some sort of like, rather than just saying like, kill four horse accordions with the smash attack or <laughs> whatever it is it's just like i don't know it just seems First like all, i hear more and more that like this game is good except the side quests are bad i'm just like i wonder like what we need to do or like start thinking about in order for that to no longer be so prevalent First of all, when you ask about what game has good side quests, this is out there, but I was thinking Vampire the Masquerade, um, kind of for the similar reason as Deus Ex Mankind Divided, because they're like, they're, there's the, those in that case, it's more like the story and characters. It's like a, it's like a separated, themed interaction, you know, story that's happening that you can experience optionally. So it's a side quest. But I think the Scarlet Nexus side quests, they kind of fail in two broad regards. One, like, there is no character or story or narrative or theme or anything at all to side quests. They're literally like a checklist of tasks, like do this thing. But two, the other thing is that even just from a gameplay perspective, you don't get anything valuable out of doing it. Like, sometimes it's like, oh, well, maybe the, the side quest itself, like, isn't very interesting, but you get a but cool it, sword or you yeah, get a different or yeah, like or something, this, but nothing. Or a game might might oh. delineate between what is a quest and what is a task, or it's like, yeah, this game has very basic tasks, but they just allow you to interact with the game, play the you know play the combat, go revisit areas that otherwise you wouldn't, and get rewarded for it, get some money, get some materials or whatever. But it seems like this doesn't even go that far. It's like the only no. reward for doing the side quest in Scarlet Nexus is to tick the box that you've done them. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so it's just uh, so it's a little like, bit like well, near, I, you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. A good game. <laughs> <laughs> but not the I don't think you get away with most yeah. of them. So no, the, 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 that was always a big black mark on the game. It's like, hey, these most of these side quests kind of ass. Some of them very good though, but unfortunately for Scarlet Nexus, all of them are ass. So you know, uh, just things to improve in a sequel. I, I think the just the one final weird thing that like I, I guess I'd, I'd add is like it has like kind of a weird economy to the game too, where like there are things you can buy for like money in the game, like in-game money, and not, there's no microtransactions. Um, but then there's like everything you can buy that you can also craft with uh, things. Uh, the only the only thing you really can't buy is like a was it attachments or was it just weapon upgrades? I forgot. But um, um, I think you can buy some weapons, some attachments, some visuals, but there's some that you can only craft. Yeah, and it's like it's like the, the economy feels are really disjointed and kind of not well thought out either on like what you can buy and craft um, because it just a, a lot of the things you can like buy or purchase in the game it's like very heavily um towards like the tales of attachment visuals yeah so, like, there, there's so things. much like when you look at like what you can buy in the shop this is actually a this is getting a little bit more into like the uh nuts and bolts but another criticism i have of the game is that like your weapons for example you don't really have a choice in terms of like what type of weapon you're using. It's literally like a linear path. Like you're upgrading your weapon from version one to version two to version three to version four to version five. And like you don't make any decision in terms of like what sorts of weapons or attributes you want to use because you're just upgrading it in linear fashion. Because like when you're looking at what you can buy or get in the shops, it feels like 75% or maybe even more is just like attachments, which are like, like Josh was saying, the visual things that you can just put on a character just for, for, kicks and giggles right um and so that's like most of the economy of the game is for that and, and like and, weapons but, and, and stuff is just not so much and, and it works to like it doesn't even work to its like advantage too because like it's easy to like oh go to this cutscene it's like oh this character looks stupid but for a lot of like the cutscene this game starting from like a after you reach the first 25 percent like get pretty serious and it's like and if you put those on they kind of take away from the scene easily because mm -hmm. like there are things Serious things happen, and it's like, hey, look at that guy. I put a stupid fucking other helmet on this dude, yeah. and he just looks really funny. Well, the, the Tales games are like that, too. I yeah, guess, yeah, yeah. Those have a little bit more levity, I suppose, in cutscenes here or there. Yeah, they're kind of they're kind of more lighthearted until, like, the final, like, 75% or the final 25% of them. This one, I feel like the, 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 the way this game progresses and the way it goes, it's like, 
Tails games get up to like that seriousness level at the last stretch. This one like gets into it pretty early and doesn't stop. I guess one, one like I don't know if you've already mentioned this, but like for people who want to give this a shot but don't know who to start with, I, I guess we'll recommend. Like you did mention it earlier you at the very beginning, a, yeah. Because of the just, way that the way the perspective works, I feel like it's a Yuito's route makes more sense in retrospect than it does like head on. So yeah, cool game, you, you, Bandai Namco. You did you did good. I'm very impressed. And I guess this will be an like ongoing thing, uh, like for one of our guides. But the anime adaptation has like keywords you can get from those uh, episodes, and like there's a there's like a mecha- or a, a little thing in this game where um, you can input those codes that they give you in the anime episodes, and then that I don't know exactly where it'll lead to, but I guess for like the first one, you get like a little text message for Yuito that shows like tell, like he gushes out about like the in-game mascot because he's a big fan of it, but. I I really wonder if like those codes will lead up to something more significant by the end. Who knows? But I I thought that was like a really cool tie-in. It's like, no, mo- most like most games don't do that. And like the confidence that Bandai Namco has put forth with this game, especially with the uh, was it the producer or the director Anabuki? I forgot. Anabuki's uh, the director. Yeah, like he he's been so out there like promoting this game everywhere he can, taking up interviews with us and other outlets, being very, very responsive on social media about this game. Like, it, it's hard not to root for this game now that it's actually proven that, like, it's a pretty good game. He's been, like, retweeting just, like, random players that have been, like, sharing their experience or pictures. Like, and he's, he's also, like, creating his own GIFs and, like, screenshot slides on Twitter and just like, hey, look at this game, that Scarlet Nexus. And what other director does that, like, for a big company <laughs> like this? Um like it, it's endearing in a way. It is, uh, you know. Uh, I'm I I become just like a, a weirdly big fan of this game as like the games the games have progressed and uh, you know we have a dedicated uh, channel for this game now and our Discord and our community seems to be like yeah the the more they play the the more they're kind of digging like this this is really getting cool. Definitely gonna have to check it out. Like it it's it's on the list for sure. And like, I'm really happy you guys are enjoying it that much. Yeah, um, I'm right so now, like with everything going on, I'm like, I, I hope August is quiet. Is August quiet? What's slated for August? actually? August is pretty quiet. Like uh, I was it's looking for like two. What? No, I'm for RPGs. Not ever <laughs> for good games. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Oof. <laughs> I tried uh, playing Psychonauts one on PC, and uh, the port wasn't very good. At least at the time. Yeah, it doesn't hold up that well. It does if you know it. But anyway, uh, time. How does George get us to go from Scarlet Nexus to Psychonauts? Uh, I'm a little uh, bit to blame by talking about by talking to <laughs> by talking about, about hoping for a gap in release schedule so I can uh, work my way through these. But yeah, that was a very entertaining listen to see like two guys who have really have really comprehensive thoughts on this game. I'm not saying you're gushing over every single aspect of it, but noting that this game is like a complete package and it's really quite interesting and kind of made a splash for a new IP and leaves room to improve, which Kind of some. I think that the way, I think the way Colin. I think the way Colin put that in his review was really smart. Just you know, what his basically review boiled down to, and he his. I think his thoughts generally line up with ours. Um, like it's got a great that, aesthetic. That, yeah, the, like Colin was the first one to, to to get hands on it, and like the evolution of his thoughts over time, and then once you started playing, once I started playing it, like there there is like a really interesting arc of our thoughts as we played through that game, going in totally blind, not knowing what to expect. Hmm. Um, but yeah, his his general thought on the game was like great aesthetic, interesting story, good characters, but room to improve. And that's you know for a new IP, like it's not a bad thing. You know if, if this game does well enough for Bandai Namco, where they decide to make it a franchise, I'm interested to see where they take it, and the now have you know feedback to base off improvements on. So yeah. easy game to root for. Hmm. Okay, I know we've been at this for nearly two hours, but uh, I, I guess it's expected and welcome, considering it's been a few weeks since we've had a chance to talk about a lot of the games that we've been playing hands-on. But Josh did have one other game listed on the document several times yeah. that he has been putting a lot of time into, and I know no, Chow no, has uh, as well. 
I, I won't I won't really get into it. I like you know, I I've obviously I've talked about it on the podcast before. Guilty Gear Strive is out. It's fucking awesome. I've been really enjoying it. I put a lot of time into it. And so, oddly enough, I've only put time into trading and um online mode, playing with friends and other and like climbing the ladder and, and the ranked system. I still haven't touched story mode. I'd like to get around to story mode, but I just like every time I boot that game, I'm like, I want to play it. I don't want to watch cutscenes. <laughs> so oh, I'm actually I'm actually like I've been watching you and Chow play it and this is a bit so I, I'm not a fighting game person at all. My entire experience with fighting games is watching Josh and Chow and a few other people play it, like in our Discord or, or otherwise. Uh enough so that I'm really st- I'm starting to like understand like May memes now. So you guys uh-huh. have prompted me. But like right. as, as soon as you understand the memes, you know you're in too deep. Yeah. But you, you <laughs> yeah. mentioned story mode. I'm like, wait, this game has a story mode? I just assumed it yep. didn't. No, it has it has a fully like a, the, the story mode is like it's just basically you turn it on and it's just like a full movie, like a full like six hour movie of cutscenes and people talking and Man. things happening. Well, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And if it's any, I haven't actually gotten Strive yet. I need to. But if it's anything like Zard, uh, they're like kind of separated into chapters. So you can still like kind of pause and yeah. come back when, when you need the, to. So. The one thing, the one thing they changed up is like uh, they don't have like the visual novel um, presentation anymore. They're like actually like full on cutscenes. With, oh, with like no, yeah so it's not like a like a text box and like character portraits exchanging dialogue it's like it's actually just full-on cutscenes now so it's kind of bizarre added, so i need to get added, it to that added four days ago to know your meme may from guilty gear strive <laughs> just the character <laughs> yeah so she is, what, what, became infamous dude how difficult it is to fight her when she summons mr dolphin an aquatic friend which has proven troublesome for may's opponents <laughs> Yeah, that may has a. There's a lot of problem characters in that game in terms of like how you fight them. It's a uh, I very I tricky. I to see the Google metrics for like how often the dolphin emoji has been used before and after Guilty Gear Strive. Oh, released. that'd be good. Oh, is her dolphin's name really just Mister Dolphin? Yep. Yep. <laughs> okay. What is that in Japanese? It's just uh, Mister Dolphin. Oh, and, 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 and then yeah, whenever she uh. Whenever she uh, summons a dolphin, like the like the lunge attack with the dolphin, she just screams Totsugeki! and then like you just hear that uh, forever in the match because she always says it. It's like, fuck, how do I? Punish it's like her catchphrase. Me? Yeah, but you know, I'm I'm gonna be playing Stripe forever, and then when Melty Blood comes out, I'll be bouncing between those two fighting games. Very excited. But, you know, Sato also says Tutsugeki when he summons his drills sometimes too. You know. Yeah, but no, you don't. You don't fight Zatos in Strive. Not right now. There's so few Zatos. It's like okay. I think it's like you rarely see. You you definitely rarely see Faust. You don't see. I've seen. No, a few no, no. Zatos. My friend is a, is a god tier Faust player. He's a he celestial T league man. Yeah, Celestial doesn't mean much anymore. No it's man, easy. he's he's it's a good god tier player. He used to be like in like tournaments, man. Okay. It'll be like a hundred rounds with this guy before you could even get like even one round out of him. Is he, is he the new Elven Shadow? Because Elven Shadow dropped uh, Faust for like Ram. <laughs> so is he? No the way, Elven? man. He he plays what he likes. He's not he's not that kind of guy. Okay, he he, he doesn't want to make money on the game. I got it. I'm just <laughs> um, but yeah, you know. Strive is good, but uh, more relevant to us, uh, Adam and I have also started playing this new Legend of Mana remaster that came out uh, yesterday. One of our new, one of our newer uh, writers and contributors on the site, uh, Scott, um, went and re- re- reviewed this remaster. He seems to really like it. Um, I- I've only put like a, f- a handful of hours into it, uh, but it looks really good. Like the one uh, thing, the, I think the most weird interesting part about this game is that we when it was announced and before it released we didn't really know who was working on it other than you know square enix announced it but it is m2 who is you know they're well known for this sort of work in terms of like porting classic games like pixel based games to newer platforms they've done a lot uh, in terms of square enix they did the collection of mana you know a couple years ago but yeah it's m2 who did the uh the work on this one so it seems to be a uh, pretty good, you know, what do you call it? Like a pretty good port to modern platforms, especially in terms of the PS4 and Switch versions. However, uh, I just started playing the PC version, and that one seems to be a little bit weirder. Yeah, uh, I, I, I've been playing on the PC also. Like it, it generally holds up performance-wise, but the, like there are weird things when the like when the background scroll it doesn't look as smooth as it could. But more importantly. Uh, when you get into combat with the PC version right now, hopefully they patch it. 
Uh, it feels like performance just tanks whenever uh, combat. Yeah. Like, uh, when you get initiated encounter, especially when you when your weapon imp, uh, hits an enemy, like it it just chugs for some weird reason. And I don't really. I, I'm still kind of in this phase of like I can still refund this game on Steam uh, and just get it on like PS5 and. That looks to be that that version to be fine, you know. I still don't know, like what I want to do. Like, I, and I'm I'm really coming close on whether I can refund it or not, as well. Because I really, I want to like I just have it on PC, just like to preserve it on PC, you know, because it'll always be there. But I, it's I don't know, I don't know. I hope they patch up that PC version fast, or at least announce that like, hey, we're gonna go fix it and whatnot. Because this seems to be a common problem. I looked at the Steam forums. Um, Hopefully to get that sorted out. I, I guess for people who don't know what Legend of Mana is, obviously, yeah, we should, we, yeah. you can probably it's, assume uh, not assume this. Yeah, it's the follow up to uh, now now the localized version of Trials of Mana. Um, this is the fourth Mana game that came out. Um, this is a, a weird uh, game in general because you, you start out, you uh, choose a protagonist, whether male or female, and then you look at this just map. And then you go to this map and they give you like this kind of sort of like, hey, where do you want to like put your home to be? And it's a very non-linear game where it kind of it just it's very much like a saga game where you kind of just have to do stuff and explore. And, you know, you can you can always follow a guide. But, you know, if you want that sense of exploration and wanderlust, the, this game is definitely for you. Um, so you plop out the, a, a section of land where you want to build your your home base and your uh, other lands to explore so like you get like this mailbox artifact and that's uh, how you uh ex- like that's how you progress in the games you collect these artifacts that you plop onto this designated land that you um set up so you plop that uh, this mailbox and you say, put it here it's like okay there's your home base now and then you know you you eventually get another artifact i think the, the you you get like a wheel artifact and then it's like, okay, where do you want to go to? Where do you want to plop out this uh, place? So like, okay, um, I don't know, put this wheel artifact here. It's like, okay, you discovered a new new town, Dormina. And then th- that's kind of like the, the cadence of the game where you go into these places and like, there's no over, like, big involved overarching plot line in the game. You're just going to these towns via the artifacts you collect. And then you see like these story arcs or events happen. You talk to NPCs. And like one of the like very early ones you can unlock is like this merchant. And like he's like, okay, um, I want to go. The way to the world. merchant is like a rabbit. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of like an- an- animal NPCs in this mm-hmm. game. And his name is Niccolo, and he's like, oh, t- I need to go to this place. And it's like, okay, I'll go assist you. And your party members are usually like a- another NPC, or you can uh, do it uh, local co-op play as well. Or and like, uh, what was the other uh, party member? You get like some sort of spirit or summon. I forgot how that worked because I'm not that far. Yeah, I am not that far either. <laughs> yeah, um, but that, that's the if you're a fan of like like a montage of like short stories, like this is definitely a game for you because like they're very digestible. The uh, the the flip side is since it's so uh, so nonlinear, it's very very easy to like miss stuff as well. Um, yeah, you'll just get to the end of the game and you and you might have to have seen like the rest of the seventy five percent of the game. You know. The, that, that's kind it's of def- like- it's definitely the type of game where um you kind of have to either a if you decide you want to absolutely see everything that you possibly can in one playthrough you pretty much have to follow a guide yeah or you just kind of have to accept that i'm just going to do this you know see where it takes me just see how things shake up and accept that i'm that i'm not going to absolutely see every single event in the game that's possible yeah. so that's just it's just that type of game I think the the real winner, uh, the real winners of this remaster are obviously the backgrounds are gorgeous. Like they did an AI upscale and like uh, did did the finishing touches on it. Did it like it'll look weird to people who are weren't exposed to it before because these are very like well filled out. Like like the landscapes and the backgrounds aren't pixelated; they're like actual full artwork. But the, your character models themselves are pixelated, so. You, you might get like this weird disjointed feeling if you're not used to that but the arranged soundtrack is incredible yeah like I, I was very surprised um like when, when we think about like 
remasters and like when they did uh remaster work to their original osts you're always kind of holding your breath like i hope they don't really change this too much like i think one of the two easy examples off the top of my head are the demon souls remake that that remade soundtrack not not great uh for a lot of its boss themes for me um and also the near replicate remaster is like it's still a really good soundtrack and really good remastered soundtrack but a lot of it is has been replaced with orchestral uh instruments so it has like a more grander epic feeling that like for me i kind of like the the more um synthesized versions of those tracks Mm -hmm. in the original version and uh, it's not bad it's just different but like it it I, I wish there was an option to go back to the original soundtrack and like you know just because i wanted to hear it again but for this one um I, I, what was the what was the uh, rearranger's name in this one adam for uh, you tweeted it i it, forgot it was like rio one second yeah because yoko shimomura did the original soundtrack for legend of mana it's well you know it's a shimomura soundtrack it already sounds incredible but this is like so the, the 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 arranger was uh, Rio Furukawa, okay, and his studio is in- Initiate Sound. And what's actually I find kind of interesting about this is like they've done quite a few mobile games, but not much outside of that sphere, except this re- this arrangement. And then uh, as well as they did some work on uh, Intergrade, so also for Square Enix. Cool. Cool. But yeah, they've done a good job. Um, and also to note. Legend of Mana, you can actually go back to the old soundtrack as well if you want, but yeah. the, the arrangement is really good. So they actually just have a music mode there. So if you just want to listen to the soundtrack, you just you just pop that mm-hmm. open. Like, here's the full list, and you can just play them at any time if you want, and just have it idle there and be like hell yeah. So if you're just doing mm-hmm. all that work, just pop open the game and like the, the jukebox mode. It's um, but you know we're still very early in it. it uh combat was never a big like outstanding aspect of the game it's there but the performance problems is a, is a shame i don't i still don't know if i'm going to refund it or not but i really want to play more of this more of this legend of mana remaster because it's it's one of my not one of my favorite games but it's it's a it's a game that i really like whenever i hear someone mention I'm like oh shit you played legend of mana hell yeah it's a good, <laughs> good <ass> game <laughs> one last thing i'll mention for this this is one of the games where the uh, like the battle effects like person on this game was Hiroshi Takai, mm-hmm. who is now okay. the director for Final Fantasy 16. Yeah, so it's kind of cool to see stuff like that. And with that, I think we're finally caught up on what we've been playing. Is that true? I think so. All right, maybe so... we'll talk more about Legend of Mana next week. And there's actually one game that I've been withholding because it'll end up being relevant in our first. So I'm looking ahead at like all the different news stories. And there's a there's a one big thing this week that we haven't even talked about yet that we still have yet to get to. So this whole podcast, even two hours plus in, we're still just kind of ramping up. Uh, before I get there, though, I do want to just kind of go through all the different features that we had kind of all mentioned in passing that are up on the site. Uh, Legend of Mana Remaster, we got the review up. Uh, from Scott, one of our newer contributors, uh, James's Monster Hunter Stories 2 PC preview, along with the video attached to that on our YouTube channel. The Scarlet, the Scarlet Nexus review, uh, Cullen's write up that we mentioned earlier, is up on the site. Um, two other things that we haven't mentioned yet, and maybe we can just briefly touch on these. Uh, one of them is a review from another new contributor, Paige, who did Disgaea 6 Defiance of Destiny. So, this is a game that obviously has been out in Japan, so people who had looked for like what the reception there kind of might have known what the uh, possible or probable outcome was here. Uh, I haven't I haven't read through her review yet, so I don't I don't have the nuance of what she mentioned, but I know she was pretty lukewarm on it. Uh, so I think I even mentioned it in a previous podcast where like I someone I follow on Twitter was playing through the Japanese version. They mentioned that. One of their problems was is that you literally can just auto battle through the entire game. So yeah. sounds good. <laughs> and I, I'm just the... noticing. I'm just. I'm noticing just now. I think it might have literally gone up as we're recording this podcast. Is that another new contributor? That's three that we're up to now. Uh, Jess has put up a review for World's End Club. Awesome. So this is a game. This is the game that uh, Josh talked about about a month ago, month and a half ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, so. I, I, this literally just went up, so I haven't read it yet. So maybe we'll be able to talk about it more uh, next week or in another venue. But an, another lukewarm review 
for that game. So that is also up on the site. It's the most recent feature. I'm sorry for bringing up another thing. Um, this doesn't have anything to do with the site directly, but um, I did contribute to at least a couple of blurbs for uh, this recent uh, JRPG book, uh, book project uh, between Hardcore Gaming 101 and a bunch of other uh, like individuals. Uh, a prior site contributor, um, Liz also contributed uh, some uh, blurbs to it too. And so, can... what this is is this is Bitmap Books, a guide to Japanese role playing games. So, yeah, it's basically a, as far as I understand, it's a fan collection of like anecdotes and blurbs and discussions about anything and everything to do with JRPGs. It was just made available for well, uh, pre order. Hmm? Yeah, Go it's ahead. more a compendium. It's that's a, that's, that's, a, that's a word I was using looking for, but I couldn't. It didn't come out of my brain properly, <laughs> but yes. I'm just going to ask if, like, uh, is that book available for pre-order for Canada? Uh, you have to import it from the UK. That's where it's based. Out of. It's going to be, gonna be on. A, well, they said it's going to be on Amazon yeah. US too. I think. Oh, okay. I think there's only going to be two thousand of the limited edition co- version, but there is a standard edition. I think. I and know. also a uh, PDF version as well. Yeah. So. Yeah, so that's uh, both James Elizio and then alumni Elizabeth Reyes. Just to be um, clear, I do get absolutely no royalties. So I'm just shouting out because I think everyone did good work on it. And it's just it's like even the previews up on their site, and we'll we'll put a link to it in our uh, post for this. Uh, just the 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 breadth of coverage just based on the preview images, like everything from like Shin Megami Tensei If to Fantasy Star to the Yakuza series, like. The whole series. Reflection. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, just and then obviously Falcom's in there and you know Soulsborn. It's it covers everything. So yeah, yeah Soulsborn is in a JRPG book. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we're we're justified by talking about Yakuza uh, yep. before like a dragon. It's all on there. So yeah, it, it looks fantastic. I, I really want to get it when it gets uh, up on Amazon in the US and whatnot. It looks it looks great. And the final feature that Adam might have a few sentences to say about is he had the chance to sit down with the Saga devs to basically follow up on, obviously, this year we saw the Saga Frontier uh, remastered, and you were able to sit down with uh, Kawazu and Mira, the Saga producer and is a director. What's Mira's title? I sat down with Kawazu, who is the boss, and Ichikawa and Mira, who are both producers on Saga Oh, they're, they're the producers. Okay. And mm-hmm. I guess I'll just let you, since you're the one that had a chance to talk to them through an interpreter, uh, just about the feature that you put up. So, yeah, I was I was invited to talk to these the, this team, which admittedly was a little bit awkward because, like, usually when there's, like, interview opportunities like this, it's because there's, like, some upcoming, like, title that effectively the interview kind of works as, like, advertising for. Like, hey, this game's coming out. Let's talk to the people making it. Uh, and you'll see that all the time, right? But in this case, it you know there is no announced saga game, like not officially coming out. So is it like a chance to reflect a little bit on the series? Um, basically, uh, in terms of nuts and bolts, in terms of what they told me, it seems like the the these re-releases that they've been doing for the saga games, such as Collection of Saga, Saga Frontier Remastered, they're doing above expectations. Um, the way they said it, maybe not like setting the world on fire, but they're doing better than they had hoped. And they especially noted the um, the uh, Steam version doing better than they expected by a significant amount, and also the uh, the Switch version of Saga Frontier Remastered being the most sold version. And they said that was actually highly unexpected. Um, they also I guess. said something that uh, I want to kind of in retrospect apologize for my skepticism on my um, initial impressions for the global version of Saga Reuniverse because especially with this recent interview it's clear that they have absolutely no plans to shutter the global release in the near future and beyond because they see it as a central hub for whenever they release a new Saga remaster might as well tie it into the mobile game and have both of them benefit. So, yeah, that, that's surprising. I, I guess it has a really, really loyal, like you know, player base. That's cool to see. Yeah, does mean I'll probably start playing it for real now because it's like, ah, uh, shit, I don't have to worry about it disappearing immediately. 
Um, two other things of note from the interview. One, and this is actually kind of an interesting thing to see like them acknowledge this. So when they released Romancing Saga 2, like a re-release, um, back in 2017, the localization on that game kind of felt like the bare minimum. Like, honestly, not a whole lot better than a machine translation. It was extremely stiff. Uh, I think a common joke people have is it sounded like it sounded like how like old people on Facebook chat with each other, like really <laughs> kind of like weirdly formal and stiff and like didn't flow well together at all. And uh, Kawazu acknowledged that like that localization was not received well. So when they did Saga Scarlet Grace in 2019, they partnered with 84, the you know the localization house that's done a ton of ton of work, um, both. Japanese to English and as well as English to Japanese localizations. And the 8.4 translation of Saga Scarlet Grace was very well received, which is, you know, rightfully so. That translation is very good. And not only that, but 8.4 actually helped them create like a glossary of terms for, for uh, um, various saga terms and mechanics. Yeah, and that's so skill smart. Skill names. Mm-hmm. And you actually, you actually see some of that in Saga Frontier Remastered where some of the skill names that were different in the like, the original release, they now line up with, you know, what they were called in Romantic Saga Three or Saga Scarlet Grace. Where like it's the same skill in different Saga games, and where it had a different name before, now it seems to be at least it's considerably more unified. So um, that going forward, like, I think that's really smart, you know, especially for a Japanese company that obviously from their end, like the the Japanese names might be the same in every game, but making sure that like when it's translated to English, that there's, there's more consistency there. So that's nice. It's the now second thing collapse is, instead of Babel crumble or whatever. Oh yeah. <laughs> Babel. It's like Babel crumb or something. Yeah. yeah. The original version. Anyway. Uh, the other thing about the interview that was, you know, worth pointing out is that they, back when Saga Frontier remastered released in April, they did a live stream for it, you know, kind of like a launch stream. And Kawazu, the boss of Saga at the time, I mean, still is, but at the time mentioned that there are three more games in the series that could be re-released. Unlimited Saga, Saga Frontier 2, and uh, the original Romancing Saga. But, you know, there's certain considerations that have to be made in terms of, like, how do we re-release it? What does it, what, ha- what needs to happen? Do we need to add any content? What about whatnot? that PS2 game you played? Uh... That's song. one of the that, that's yeah. romancing saga. Um, yeah, it's a remake that's, of that's, romancing saga one. Yeah, minstrel song. Um, so I actually did ask about romancing saga, but he didn't answer about it. Um, but he did answer about unlimited saga. But basically, what he said was we can't say a lot, but something like unlimited saga might require some adjustments to be re released because unlimited saga is kind of has this reputation. It's notorious almost for being just like even more so than other saga games, it's very hard to like understand and you really have to work at it to really know what you're doing and how to play it. And I know some people who actually do like this game a lot. Um, it did not review well. I think it, I think it's sitting at a Metacritic of 45. So that's not, that's honestly terrible, but um, it seems like the type of game that could really benefit from like what Saga Scarlet Grace had, just some sort of like tutorials or explanations on how things work. I've never actually played it. So I'm just speaking from, you know what I've gathered about it. I think Josh has maybe played it. Yeah, but... uh, Chow and I have played it. Um, yeah, I mean, you, it, it having a forty-five on Metacritic does not surprise both of us. <laughs> That's yeah. sure. um, so he, it, it, what he basically said at that point was, um, if we re-release it, we might need to make some adjustments to it, implying you know maybe make it easier to swallow because they don't want to release a game and have it get another forty-five Metacritic, right? right? Um, and that might take some time. However, he'd also mentioned that some games he might be able to re-release without doing much to it at all and just, you know, normal re-release tune-up or whatever and then have it released. He didn't say it by name, but from what I gather, it seems like Saga Frontier 2 is a pretty complete, no missing portions, no necessary adjustments needed type of game. It seems like that they they might just be able to make like some normal remaster tweaks and release it. Um he didn't say that by name, but it's you know it seemed to be a logical next step. Yeah, I, I yeah. don't remember it being like severely like incomplete. Do you, do you remember anything, Chow, on the Saga Frontier two development? That, I think like, the only thing they need to change is probably highlight um, what chapter order it is because you're okay. playing the game and you're like, it's like every chapter is sorted by their name and you don't know 
which this chapter belongs to. <laughs> is this belong to this guy or is this belong to that guy? Right. You don't that's know. kind of funny to imagine like a chapter order that's not in numerical order, but by yeah, there's no by numerics, order. right? It'll be like <laughs> final battle with with this, and you play this chapter, it's like, oh, it's not the final battle. And it'll be like, <laughs> okay, but you know, it's like they need to put some kind of order so you know if it's you know it belongs to either Gustav scenario or Will Knight scenario. And I think that's also a problem when you play Second Frontier 2 when you start a new game plus. It has all the chapters unlocked. And now you'll be like, oh, how do I play this game in, in chronicle logic order now again, right? Okay, yeah, yeah. So there was, yeah. A, there was a nice opportunity to get a chance to, to speak with them. Um, I'm a big fan of the Saga series. So I'm interested to see what's next. They They sort of soft announced that they are working on a new Saga game, but you know we don't know anything about it other than that kind kind of just they like well we could have assumed that they were working on something they're just confirming that yes we're working on something well, it's, it's in, a sort in of the thing series like, we're known for <laughs> it's a sort of thing like if square enix comes out and just says we're working on the next final fantasy game it's like well of course you are right yeah, but yeah. saga it's not so certain like that yeah you're that right that they would right. be making I a new would... game so it's kind of nice that they say yes we are i would bet that um we might just get it announced like during TGS because I do know that the original version of Scarlet Grace came out like late 2016. So it's not like it's it's been five years or almost five years. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it's about time. Yeah, they, about they time. usually they usually have a dedicated saga stage event at TGS. So it, it makes sense. They usually have like a sick concert uh, to accommodate it. And that was our feature rundown. So, yeah, I just want to mention. I just want to uh, make one final mention. Like, uh, obviously, you know, you, you hear, you hear, you hear, <laughs> our, you hear our voices. Yeah, you hear our voices a lot of the podcasts and like throughout the articles. But really, give uh, give our newcomers a shot uh, with Scott's Legend of Mana review, with uh, Paige's uh, Disgaea Six uh, review, and uh, Jess's uh, World's End Club review. Like, you know, you're going to see be seeing a lot more of them. They're they're part of the crew now. We're hopefully going to try to get some of them on the podcast, maybe in the future, uh, if they're interested. But, you know, uh, welcome them with, with open arms. Uh, they and also, a, uh, so, so, he, uh, uh, some of them did an amazing job, especially during E3, that you may have caught some of their news uh, bits that they uh, helped us out uh, during that time. That's exactly what I was going to mention. Like, he doesn't have a recent feature, but Nathan did help with news on E3 yes. coverage front. So that's a bunch yeah, of new Nathan names. Did the story of seasons, right? The story, mm-hmm. the story of seasons review. Yeah, he did that. Yeah, and maybe if we can convince them to spend three plus hours with us in this podcast, you'll hear their voices. What are you doing? <laughs> it's, a, it's a big ask. So here we are, two and a half hours in, finally moving on to news topics. And normally this would be like, okay, whatever, it's just news, so let's run through it. But this is headlined by a uh, by a pretty big one from the uh, from the biggest insider in the industry, known as the Epic Game Store database. <laughs> so we talked about I... last week about the uh, Final Fantasy PC port, uh, Final Fantasy VII Remake PC port showing up in the uh, database. And then ahead of the NGPX presentation slash Falcom 40th anniversary event, we've learned about 24 hours early, thanks to Epic Game Store, about the incoming... Nice America localization of four Kiseki slash Trails games. So these are Trails from Zero, Trails to Azure, Trails into Reverie, formerly known as Hajimari no Kiseki. Well, not formerly, known in Japan as Hajimari no Kiseki. And then also The Legend of Neyuta Boundless Trails. I know that's a lot of titles that I just rattled off. Don't but Azure, worry. go ahead. You'll have you'll have plenty of time to memorize yeah. them before you can actually play. Uh, should I just kind of... Hold on, hold on. Here, let me, let, let me, get, let me get a little bit more context. Yeah. yeah, let me yeah. get a little more context. So this is... the, the there's, there's basically three parts to this. The, the first part is that the crossbell problem has now... Well, is now underway to being addressed. Crossbell are two games basically smack in the middle. Well, now now towards the, now towards the front half of the whole overarching series that had been skipped over by official localization efforts that you kind of had to look through other means, such as the recent Geofront fan translations. More on that later. Uh, so now they are going to get official releases. These are games that take place more or less 
there are some caveats between the Trails in the Sky trilogy and the Trails of Cold Steel four part series. So this is kind of a gap in the official releases that starting in fall 2022 will now have an official English release. The second part is that Hajimari no Kaseki, as of right now, the most currently, like the furthest out game, is now going to have an English title, Trails into Reverie, that is titled, or sorry, slated for 2023. What are the release platforms for these games? uh, The platforms are uh, PlayStation 4, PC. Is that it? Did I miss one? No, there's Switch. 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 Oh, they're also on Switch. I feel like... I feel like I should uh, also for you can say PC, but when you say, oh, well, it leaked on the Epic Games Store. Oh, yeah. So it leaked on Epic, but it is Steam Steam Gog. Steam and Gog as well. Yeah. Yeah. Epic was just the megaphone at which apparently all announcements are made these days. (laughs) Uh, They are not Epic exclusive, timed or otherwise. They're just going to also show up on Epic, similar to Nice America's Cold Steel 3 and 4. So all of these games now have store pages, both on Steam and on Epic. I'm not sure if they're on GOG yet. Uh, Short little trailers that are honestly not that exciting. Some screenshots from like very early in each of the games, I presume. Yeah, It also also confirms to uh, that Falcom and Nisa have also confirmed that Xbox is no longer a platform when they showed the trailers. It says coming to all platforms that we just listed. (laughs) So there's no Xbox logo in any of them. So yeah. Xbox, Xbox and Microsoft. I'm sorry. Xbox You're, is just a fever dream. We all we all yep. did some, <laughs> bought man, it up. Um, what man. what a heel turn after putting the Sky F4 Complete Plus on Game Pass. Jeez, <laughs> still so random. <laughs> but yeah, so all of these titles are slated for just a generic 2023, with the exception Except of Trails from Zero, which is fall 2022. So yeah. um, does that mean I have to wait till 2024 to play Kuro no Kisaki in English? I'm, gonna, oh, wait, I'm just going to import it. I At this point, like with Hajimari and well, Reverie and Kuro so far away, I'm just nah, nah, nah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm bite. I'm just ripping that bandaid off now. Thank God. Yeah, I, got, yeah, 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 I guess that's the ripple effect of like, since uh, now that, now that they have to under underway to solve the cross belt pro- problem, like we, they are now pushing out further titles. Yeah, you know, in the, it's in also the it's also um, just one thing to think about. So Falcom basically announces and releases a game every year, right? Like right. some so there's some exceptions, but broadly it's like one game a year, right? Yeah, but so, kind of yeah, so like they almost always announce at like their press their, at their like investor event in December. So in December of this year, Kuro, Kuro no will have been released in Japan. And it's very likely that Falcom will announce another title at that point, whether it's East 10, Tokyo Xanado 2, something else. I don't know. But uh, it's like, by, by, and we'll, it'll feel like we're almost even further behind, right? Um, by the time like, that Reverie releases in the West, there is a very, very real possibility that we will have both Kudo and whatever the next Trails title after that is already released in Japan. Yeah, like Kuro mm-hmm. no two will already exist. Yeah. Okay, so let, let's uh, let's uh, before we get yeah, too there's far, a lot, there's a lot of details stuff. to get yeah. into here. Let's, uh, um, let's get into the the, the geo front situation. Uh, you can go introduce that, Brian. Yeah, uh, uh, or, uh, you can go. Go ahead, James. I just want to be very clear from the offset here, and uh, Chow can attest to this. So, and I guess even to a lesser extent, Josh is. Uh, but both Chow and I did actually help test the. Trails from Zero um, beta build for the fan translation patch, which normally wouldn't be a big deal, except uh, one of the other announcements, though Nisa didn't explicitly say it themselves, but there was a back and forth on Twitter, and Geofront announced it. The crossbell localizations for, well, Trails from Zero and Trails to Azure are using the Geofront translations as a base, and as a result of that, Nisa has bought out the fan translations. If you wanted to download the fan translation patches for either of those games and you hadn't already, you're going to have to find them through other means because they have been taken down from the official Geofront website. Also, as a ripple effect from that, and Colin has has talked about this on Twitter, so Colin actually directly contributed to the Geofront project. He helped with the English opening for Trails from Zero. 
That opening is not going to be used in the official localization, but because he was a member of a team, he did get paid for his work on the project. And we have a disclosure for this on the article, like going over the official announcements. But just to be clear, for the foreseeable future, he is not covering NIS America titles. I don't know about Falcom stuff. I guess in the weird situation where a Falcom title got localized, it wasn't Nisa. It might be a gray area. Because but- on the letter, the the letter of what happened is he got paid because NIS America, one way or another, bought it. So he got paid by NIS America. But you know, we don't need to worry too much about like what ifs right now. But uh, for yeah. now, he just cannot cover. We, we he's not going to cover NIS America stuff because that's a conflict of interest. So yeah, yeah. and even though neither Chow or mm-hmm. I got paid, we are both buddies with the Geofront people. Uh, we've met them. Well, I've met them in person several times. And uh, as a result of that, neither of us will be covering Trails from Zero or Trails to Zero. It'll have to be other staff that'll take over for that. And this is this is kind of obvious, but it's like when you tested this, you had no idea that it was going to become an official thing, right? Yeah, oh, it, yeah, was, no. it was. It wasn't an um, East American product at the time. It was a fan. It was yeah, a well, we, we had no idea, right? It's I mean, not yeah. like you went into it saying like, "Oh, oh this is yeah, going to be an official and a published thing, thing, right?" Yeah. Is that obvi- obviously because of Colin? Those of us on the staff were aware of this announcement coming a, a certain degree in advance. So before this was announced, we knew that what was happening. But uh, yeah, so that's the situation. It's great to see the localizations coming. It's a little bit odd that since they've already got completed translations, it's taking so long for Zero and Azure to come over. But official releases, it's coming to consoles. I mean, People should be happy that, that they're yeah. getting official localization. It's so probably it's more so on the production side of things than the translation. Because obviously these these fan translations are going to need to be edited. Like they're not just going to wholesale just assume they're perfect and send them out. They're going to go through. And, 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 like, and a lot of like bug testing throughout not, not yeah. just one platform. It's now you have PS4 and Switch. And then you have to think about are they doing the, 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 the Kai ports or is it? They a, are a doing the Kai thing? ports. Okay. But yeah, NIS and, America uh, obviously has a lot of other products that they're working on. They have Caligula 2. They have Monarch. There's other Nippon Ichi software games that are coming yeah. out that they're pretty much obligated to cover, right? Yeah. So uh, uh, also, I guess uh, just, I guess for my part, I, I was name dropped by James earlier. The only other, the only involvement I ever had in this is you. There's an old Tetracast special episode that I mean, we should probably do more of those special episodes, but you know because of time. But you know, I I'm friends with some of the GeoFront team. That notably, uh, her she goes her her online handle is uh, Fluffy, and also Guan. Um, you know, I it was just basically you know a, a journalist um, kind of interviewing them about like you know well how the, just up uh, at the time they're upcoming like translation patch for zero mm-hmm. i think yeah so is that, is that long ago i i, I want to say that i feel like i don't want to feel awkward about us having helped with the like beta testing for the fan translation if anything like i've, I've done my own things like i've helped with editing with other fan translation projects in the past none of them are going to be bought out because they're games that are never going to see a port and they're on like old hardware but i think as long as we're honest about it, I don't see a real real problem. And as long as when situations like this occur with a translation actually being bought out, we just do our due diligence. Yeah, it's just, yeah, it's just, it's just disclaimers, like you know, just letting people like it, like like if if like if say say like if uh, Adam wanted to review um, what was this week in project A A U A U N A U N, like you know, you've contributed to that Kickstarter, so like if you were to write like a review on it or whatever, you do you have to put. I, I, uh, you know, I, 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 I I contributed to that Kickstarter, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I do want to mention this as like a f- f- bit of trivia. This isn't like the first time a Falcon game has been officially released based on a fan translation. Xseed had several. Um, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure Chronicle, East Chronicle version, that's one and two, East Origin, Oath and Thalgana, as well as Anadu Next. Are all Xseed releases of Falcom games based on fan translations? I just thought that you know it's kind of interesting. Like this isn't this isn't like 
uncharted territory. Like this has happened before from a different publisher. Just just um, double checking. I, I, I have a Silicon Era article from 2010 saying East the Oath and Felghana uses a fan translation as a base. So like, yeah, I, I, I know that and, and, listed, Next but it, and Origin for sure. I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure on Chronicle. I think it did, too. Yeah. In any case, a few of them. I, I think I think the 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 distinguisher is that it's like scale and like how. Yeah, obviously, those are much bigger issue. projects like yeah. in terms of scope of te- how much text there is. But yeah, I just thought it was an interesting bit yeah. of trivia. So, you know, that that's it's still a lo- unfortunately a long time off. But in the long run, you know, it's. It's good. It's good. They need yeah. it, like they needed to do something for yeah. um, getting Crossbell kind of, out, yeah. and like they had to do. It, it's also that. funny because like on, on another level, this had to be done uh, if you wanted to release ha- Hajimari or now Reverie out in the West because uh, that like for some features of that game, you need uh, like uh, save data from Azure. I think I, I forgot if it, it takes zero, but at the very least, Azure save data. Um, is implemented into that game. I yeah, think going forward, like I, I doubt this will happen, but like if we want, if Falcom wants like these releases to be end up eventually being closer and more worldwide, whatever whatever their next game is, like when they announce something, it's East Ten. They really just need a different. They need a partner with someone else to localize it. I don't know if that's ever going to happen. So they can double up and do like a spring fall. Or yeah, something like that. like, I, like while while NIS America is releasing these Trails games in 2023, maybe Access Games releases East Ten or something. I don't know. Like somebody else. <laughs> so, but I don't know. That's just who knows if that's going to happen. I don't know. They would ever sure want to would... partner with Exit again. Well, I think it's less an issue with Falcom wanting to partner with them and the other way around. But, yeah, uh, possibly. <laughs> it's a, it's um, just it's just a, a weird, unfortunate situation because like their their revenue uh, territory wise is like the, the West makes up so little of that revenue incoming revenue for them. Whenever they do like the detailed breakdowns in their investor meetings, like compared to China, mm-hmm. like that there's mm-hmm. a reason why China uh, Korea gets like simultaneous localizations of of new trails games, and we're so far behind. You know, they're the ones. Oh putting in a lot of money and to, feel, to make that worth it yeah. i feel relatively confident in saying and i and i i really don't mean to be negative about this but trails into reverie is going to be a huge financial bomb like just there is so much like baggage you have to go through in order to be even be able to tell someone yeah you can play this now you just have to play the nine other games that come before it mm-hmm <laughs> Yeah, the yeah. thing is, though, is like even if every single Trails game had like a stellar reputation, there is going to be some sort of attrition where, like, let's say 90% of everyone that plays a game goes, or even like 95%, everyone that plays a, a game in the series sequences to the next and to the next to the next. After enough iterations, your, your, your potential player base is going to shrink. And you might be able to pull at East America and be like, Corona Kaseki 2 is a perfect jumping on point or whatever. <laughs> but, but, but eventually it's just going to be, there's going to be so much requirements, too, too strict of a word, but there's going to be so much like baked in, you know, anticipation where it's like you need to have played everything up to this point or at least like a, a portion of it to have any semblance of what's going on. You're just shrinking the potential player base more and more and more. So that's something where it's like, I don't want to say that's a problem you need to address because it's not necessarily a problem. It's just kind of like as long as they understand that that this the, you're going to have a huge hurdle to overcome if you're going to ever grow the popularity of this. Uh, can it's you just like weird. imagine like a modern day like like a, a modern day like fifteen or sixteen year old like oh this Kuro no Kaseki game looks interesting I want to play it and like wait it, it's like heavily relying on these this like these ten year old games that. So ninety five percent like five time. years old or or ninety five percent to the tenth power yet? is sixty percent. Ninety five percent to the tenth power is sixty percent. So that I know that's very like stupid math, and I'm trying to like I'm trying to turn down like I'm trying to like combine marketing and all this into like one nice to use number. But that's just like a good example of showing like even if most of the people that play one game go to the next, go to the next, go to the next, it's just going to shrink. It's it, it just also, is. Adam, you, you know what's kind of funny uh, though. Just to put in perspective. Uh, by the time Kuro finally comes out in English, which I would assume would probably be 2024, since it's already it's like 20 years old. It's got yeah, like how old is Sky, sky be at that point? Yeah, it will be 
it came out in 2004, so it literally have been 20 years old. Yeah. So just like, eh. <laughs> but you know, I was just gonna say, you know, this kind of problem is something that the Gundam series had from doing a UC universe, right? You know, they tried to reboot the cl- stay clean by making like different timelines and different shows, but I think they could just never reach the popularity of the original series, so they always had to like go back to it, you know. You, you want to like a, even a more modern nightmare scenario that now that's currently unfolding is the is Mac the Macross series has finally like they finally got over the Harmony Gold problem of like reaching an agreement with them and now they can distribute like a good uh, a vast majority of the Macross series in the West now and that'll take into effect I think next year but it's that they have a long road ahead of them and hopefully like the the fan the Western fan base will support that. Now that they can finally be officially released in the West and distributed in the West, you know, it's all this, this sort of problem is not exclusive to the video game series, it's not right, exclusive yeah. to the uh, Nisa Falcom. It, it happens all around because licenses are messy. It, uh, you know, Super Robot Wars had to overcome it by saying, we'll make English versions, but only for the Southeast Asian territory because th- there's trying to do that a Western release of Super Robot Wars games with those licenses is a licensing nightmare because the, the infrastructure of uh, licenses in the West and how that treats it, and even in like different territories in the in the Euro, uh, Europe, you know, it's it's not feasible. It's not financially sound. You you would tank your company before you can even release it. You right. Know? Yeah. But, uh, so it's like it's just different hurdles, and hopefully, in the long run, you know, once Falcom gets done with the Trails series uh, in our lifetimes, hopefully, um, at least we can say, hey, at least there are. Official localizations of all yeah, of these games. Twenty thirty. I, I <laughs> do think that taking care of the cross belt problem now. At least, like, I, I could change my mind if someone presents a good argument, but I feel like it's good to get this out of the way and not punt it downfield. I know some people are like, I can't believe we have to wait till twenty twenty three for Hajimari, but I'm just thinking like, what are the alternatives? Hajimari comes out twenty twenty two. And then Crossbell slotted in before Kuro, and then we had wait extra long. You know what I mean? Like you're just like shuffling. Yeah, that, the order. I, I, you have yeah, to slot it, in somewhere. Yeah, I, th- I think that I think a lot of people are, are just like worried about momentum. Like uh, since even though divisive, like uh, there's still a good chunk of the fan base that like were, was very high on Cold Cold Steel Four and really wants more. And now with this, it just ju- it just brings that momentum down. It does. Especially it does broaden when, especially the gap. With, Temporary. Yeah, especially when yeah, especially when a lot of that fan base was already expecting either Hajimari to come like next year, this year you know, maybe, or maybe even yeah, maybe even this, expected year. It this year. <laughs> yeah, but it's you know, uh, in the long run, it's good. In, in the right now, at the this very moment, I guess I can. It's frustrating. I, I know why. It, I know why it burns. Yeah, yeah, but. Uh, there's a couple but, other uh, footnotes to in, in this announcement that I think are interesting to talk about, even though they might be like clerical errors in a specific sense. Both the Epic Store page and the Steam Store page list that the Crossfell games, Zero and Azure, will obviously have English text, but only Japanese voiceover. That's interesting to note because obviously the Kai versions of these games do have more full voiceover compared to the original release. That's, Evo, that's the Evo versions, not the Kai versions. The Kai I, versions thought, the, are I like, thought the Kai versions had the Evo voice acting. No, no, but they did have it. Apparently, did they, the, 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 the Kai versions. I was thinking like how uh, the, the the licensing issues, but apparently they got that sorted out, and the oh, Kai okay. version actually has. I, like, I thought it was still like. I'm not the... sure. Again, I'm not sure if the voice acting in Kai is the same exact voicing as Evo, but I do know it has voice acting. Okay, okay. I thought it's like it shows of the Sky Kai where like there was barely any voice acting still it's like in battle. Yeah, yeah, but okay. for what, whether whether it's full voice acting or some sort of in between, it seems like according to the store listings, the Crossbow games will not have English voice acting, which is interesting because obviously a lot of those cast have shown up in the later Cold Steel games, so they already have like voice talent assigned to those characters. But we don't know the like, details of this localization effort. Obviously, with the, I, I, the I'm I'm not too surprised by that. I feel like the audience for these games isn't as big as like the next newest shiniest thing. So like. Maybe are just not gonna worth spend like, all that. Yeah, money? I, mean, I really, I really wonder like how much these are gonna sell. Period, dude. Like the 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 the, the audience for this like upcoming release is like it feels so small. They either like, already imported it or have the fan translation ready to go. I've already played it. Yeah, but I can. I, I don't know if I could use this as a metric, but 
um you know like i wrote the trails guides i got more views from the trails of azure guide than than sky the third like by double so i don't know if that could be a metric measure but i don't know i don't know oh, it's, a, it's, it's a weird one it's a weird one and then um the other the the follow-up to that is that obviously uh reverie Hajimari no Kiseki will have English text and voiceover. That's to be expected. It's nice to have confirmation. The interesting one is that Nayuta Boundless Trails, which is uh, one of you experts can maybe fill me in, but it seems like a, a kind of an action spinoff where it's, it's not a, canon it's yet, white. but it could be. <laughs> uh, pretty much most people assume it is canon, but the reasons why, again, would be a spoiler. Uh, basically, most people are saying the reason, the fact that it's being localized kind of soft confirm some of the uh, f theories people have um as for the gameplay itself it's basically y3 but not called y3 because y2 bombed so hard that they basically can't but why as a series is dead yeah it's poisoned yeah. poisoned no, I, I have a, anyways I have what, a I, what i need question. to get you sorry what i need to get you is that for that store listing it only lists japanese voice and text no english which i assume is a clinical yeah, error but as of right no, now it's, not. it's weird but basically they've already confirmed that it will have english text and voices eventually but when it, the pc port comes out for nayuta at first it'll own in like early 2022 or something like that it's only going to be Japanese. Oh, I see. So the so the announcement of the 2023 release will have English, but the store page going up on Steam, which is a for all regions, it'll be earlier, but for Japanese supported initially. That's oh. what I understand. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there have, have been a few. There have been a few games it, like but... that where a game comes out on Steam and then gets like a an English localization update, and it's like the same listing. Yeah, <laughs> so, <laughs> I remember right. our wizard we talked off a few weeks back. Like, I have a weird question about it. I I'm not sure if everyone's into like the Japanese voice acting, but one of the fairies that joins your party in Not Yuta is voiced by uh, Aikiano, and she's basically facing controversy in China right now for being canceled for visiting a shine. I don't know if they were like trying to get rid of like the voices for Not Yuta when they were releasing it in China or something. I don't, I don't know. I, I heard about that controversy. It's uh, for the purposes of this, I'd be like kind of a weird abyss to dive into, but I, I don't think it'll be too big of an issue, honestly, at the moment. Because those contracts are already filled out, they're, they're already signed. It's like replacing the voices all of a sudden. It'll be, it'll be I mean, really well, weird. I mean, if they do, then there's a confirmation, you know, but that's a, that's a whole other can topic. of worms. Yeah, that's a whole other topic. Better not dive into that one. It's an unfortunate situation. I hope Kayano did the best out of it. So this puts me in a slightly weird position. Not not that bad. Uh, it's honestly very small. But I had gone into this podcast from a couple of weeks ago, having just recently played the fan translation of Trails to Azure. And in, in May or late April, I had played From Zero. And I was just planning to talk about it as like a fan, like, oh, I play this import or this fan translation and here are my general thoughts. But now like the whole context behind that is a little bit different because it's like, I don't want to just be like, by the way, this game's coming out next year. I'm going to, or not next year, the year after. And now I'm going to tell you all of my opinions on it. Like, it just seems kind of weird. Uh, obviously I wouldn't spoil anything anyway. Uh, but so I, like the games you play will get a remaster or official English version. Can you do something with Fire Emblem 4, please? Just play it. Maybe be Nintendo well, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's, not like, it's not like I played these games on a whim. I waited for the fan translation and then I played them. It's not like I went to like uh, an old catalog game and decided I want to know what the, I, I've done that before. I did it with Baldur's Gate and Fallout. I haven't done it with a Japanese game in a while. Um, so I will I will give my quick like two sentence summary on Azure and Zero. So, because I don't want to really go much more in detail than that, I just feel like that's kind of indulgent um, with the with the official announcements made. Uh, Zero, I already talked about. I really liked a lot. It's in contention for my favorite game in the series. It's really, really good. It's coming out next year officially. Anyone who feels spurned or not spurned on recent games should give Zero a try. I think it's one of the highlights of the series. Azure is my I, favorite game, but of the I've series, but I've heard that Azure is very popular. Um, this is I don't have a metric for that. That's just me. That's just me kind of diluting what I what I read from other people. I did not like it as much as Zero. I liked Zero more, but Azure is still like in the top four or five of the series for me. It's, still it, it just really said a good. lot of. 
it does have a lot of bad tropes that the later series start to follow. It does. Yeah, have, so, it, zero, zero and Al like started like they, they were the poison that <laughs> that that, that but from so the before, yeah, it before wasn't talk, bad before. I don't I don't want to talk negatively about it at least not first. But Azure, I think yeah. one thing it does really well is that I think the two part series Zero and Azure has the appropriate amount of escalation. It starts small time in zero with a very centralized cast and a very centralized location and slowly feeds in like the escalation and it builds and builds and builds. And then uh, obviously it kind of climaxes at the end of that and kind of resets a little bit in Azure. And then it continues to build and build and build until you have like these really high important stakes right at where the end where everything feels appropriately climactic. And it ends up being remaining believable and tense with a few story considerations that I thought were a bit silly, but in general, very, very good. That's something that I think that Cold Steel didn't really do very well because it had four games to spread this out like too little jam over too much bread. It just kind of had to like repeat itself and there's a little bit too much iteration and eventually the stakes are so high and I haven't played four yet. This is me only just talking about three games here that I just felt no longer invested. Or I felt like if there was a third crossbell game, I might run into the same thing, but there wasn't. It was two. It ended in an appropriate spot. It's a really good pair of games. So that's my very vague... Go ahead. I don't think it's a hot take. I feel like everyone that's played the, the, the whole series up to this point will agree that of all of the arcs, crossbell is the uh, are the games that have hands down the best pacing. Because even in Trails in the Sky, they changed the format of third to try to prevent that a little bit. Obviously, it had that, I forget the name of that Gehenna Dungeon Tower thing. Um, but uh, they kind of changed the format to try to like avoid having this sort of like raising the stakes, raising the stakes, raising the stakes. They do to some extent, but in a different context. So I still think that Trails in the Trails third works where Cold Seal, it just feels like they just keep building and building and building and building to a sense where it feels like a Jenga tower. And it just it no almost longer... gets it's almost like absurd at a point. Just like yeah. yeah. I, and so that's the first thing with Azure, right? The stakes felt a lot more believable. And mm-hmm. it gets exactly and the build up is just like, oh yeah, it's it's from smaller scales. I'm just dealing with the mafia now. And now I'm just dealing with, you know, a little bit higher and a little bit higher. And it just feels a little bit believable. But while the, the, the other the one very, is like... The, like the oh, last touch. two chapters of Azure, and while well, I'm not spoiling anything, the last two of chapters of Azure is when it finally really feels like these are very important events that could affect the whole continent. Like, just at the very climax of the second game. It's like, that seems appropriate. Where if that had to build into another title, I'd be like, okay, I don't know if I believe this anymore. But it doesn't do that. So I think it's a really strong pairing of games. The only negative thing I will have to say about it is that it does kind of fall into that trope where there's certain characters that go off the Angelica template, which I'm just like rolling my eyes at, or I'm just like, I don't know if this really adds to the game in any meaningful way. I'm talking about Ilya. Ilya, I think is a very bad character. I don't enjoy her at all. She's, (laughs) she's a one note joke. That is not Mm -hmm. even really a joke that Uh boob jokes. it's yeah she basically sexually harasses both people that work under her it's very very stupid and i just have to roll my eyes and be like everything else about the game is stellar but i think you could delete that character from the game and lose nothing from it (laughs) and i know she shows up later in the series so i don't know if that would pay dividends but (laughs) we got some bad news for you (laughs) yeah i know all right so so, look all 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 i'm hearing is since there are like at least three people who cannot touch these games on the site. You see, it sounds like you're the primary reviewer now for, for the official release. Well, obviously, I would want to play the official release if if that were to be. First of all, it's a, a year plus away. Sad face, uh, but um, also like all the Kai stuff and how does that factor in? If in any it's still way a weird situation where, like, obviously, at least part of the translation is going to have another editing pass, but like, you got to imagine that, like. The the majority of what you played in the Geofront localizations will probably be representative of the final product because it's like it it it's literally using Geofront as a base. My favorite part about Zero, I think, is that it spends a little bit more time just having characters interact rather than just having plot progress forward, like you're being pulled from a string from the start line to the finish line. Uh, I think po- my favorite thing about Zero is that you have essentially the same party for the entire game. Mm-hmm. And you have your full party from the like the start. So having like a, a group of four people that just 
they felt really, like family. That's the yeah, thing. Yeah, they really do feel like a family. And then when they do eventually like kind of mix things up in Azure, they, they do it with enough restraint that it doesn't feel like it's disrupting the dynamic when you very easily could have. Yeah. One of my favorite parts of Zero is there's this, there's this really quiet, and I'm not, I'm not going to tell you what this, say what the scene says. I'm just going to describe it um, gen generically. There's this very like quiet scene between Lloyd and Randy where they just talk about like the trust they have in each other and like how Randy is not willing to like share some information yet. And Lloyd's 100% fine with that because he doesn't need to know that in order to know that he can rely on him. It's just a very quiet moment that doesn't really progress the plot. It doesn't really rely too much on intrigue about he knows something you don't or whatever. It's just, it's some, it's moments like that, that I feel like are lost when you balloon the cast too much, which the crossbow games avoid. So I'm looking forward to revisiting these like once. So give it, give it a year and a half and my memory will start to be foggy and I'll, have to at least replay them through in some extent with the official translation just to see like what is I preserved. haven't revisited the series since I completed my guide back in 2017. <laughs> Your guide, I did follow it though, and I it got me every treasure chest. So thank you. Jesus, I didn't get one of them. <laughs> I can't so I'm, I'm, I'm making the guide. I'm missing stuff in my own game. <laughs> but yeah, that was uh, quite a quite a headliner for this week and here we are reaching the three hour mark having finally talked about it is there any other like details or nuances concerning this weird leak followed by announcement followed by additional details leaking through that i haven't that i've neglected to cover i think you got uh, it all i think we're, we're good i guess my follow-up question then is like what is there a falcom title for this for this holiday really not I mean, Crows nope. this year. Well, I mean, I meant for no, sorry for mean. for a localized for English official announcement. We have no. we have like the PC port of Yeast Nine coming, uh, and Cold Steel Four's PC port released a few months ago. But other than that, it seems like this year is going to be kind of quiet on that front. Good because I need to uh, spend time SMT Five. <laughs> yes, can't, can't Metroid wait Dread. to uh, imp import Hajimari and. <laughs> get through it in time for Kuro because I am not waiting that long to play. Uh, I think I'm just going to skip Hajimari and just go directly to Kuro. Look, I know that's... You can pull what you did I before am, with Nier and watch the YouTube video. Yeah, I know I'm the last person to say this considering how down I was about Cold Steel 4, but I've seen enough people that I trust their opinions on the series that felt exactly the same about Cold Steel 4 said, but Hajimari is actually good though, that I, I gotta see it for myself, but I'm... I'm actually interested in Kuro, and I'm I not going to wait things. that long. I, I also right, hear, like... We, we need to stop for our audience. You know, We, we need to stop for, for the sake of our listeners. We need uh, to move on. Remember, wait, this was going to be a normal link podcast? Oh, anyways, here we go. Uh, all right, so some of the remaining topics we might not be able to indulge in as much. Uh, obviously, we'll try to do their due diligence. Uh, oh, on the Japanese so side... many Falcom games that we have become them over sharing useless context that doesn't actually matter. We, 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 we have become what we fear most. Uh, but, okay, so a little bit more on that front. Uh, we did get a, some official announcements from the Japanese side of things regarding Kuro no uh, A couple weeks ago, we learned about some returning characters to the series that I'll be making a an appearance in that game. Uh, last week, we were announced... Uh, we had the announcement of two new characters. Uh, so one of them is a A rank brace, an A rank bracer from Calvard named Elaine Auclair. And another one is a Central Intelligence Agency character named Renee Kincaird. So these two characters basically have ties to, or presumably have ties to other characters that we've already been introduced to. Elaine is a bracer, so I assume that she has history with Zinn. I don't know that for certain. I'm speculating. Uh, a little bit of her character bio released by Falcom uh, talks about how she went to this prestigious school and how some people had kind of earmarked her as like an actor or like a, a, like a model of some sort, but she's, you know, she's loyal to the blade or, or whatever. So she's a bracer through and through. Um, Renee Kincaird, works underneath Kilika, who is uh, a former bracer who now works for the Talvardian government. So I've seen a lot of people hyped for these characters, especially for Elaine. I don't know if you guys have any more uh, comments. Uh, uh, high profile uh, voice actors for them. Uh, Shiva Saito's doing Elaine and Jun Fukuyama for Renee. Uh, very, 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 very well known 
in Japan for both of them, uh, very prevalent in anime. Um, I, I think I think that the next uh, bit that we're going to get into is the the one that kind of makes my ears perk up for uh, Kuro. Well, actually, I just now realized. I guess I'm 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 spoiling myself on the Kaseki wiki. I guess Elaine is mentioned by not Elaine. Yeah, Elaine is mentioned by name somewhere in Hajimari. I didn't realize that. So she's. Kind of uh, like, it's a post game. Yeah, it's a post game thing. It's, oh, it's, so it's, it's kind like, of like it's like teasing into the next game. All right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And what what was that going on to next? Like that was like, okay. Oh, so have, in in Kase- this is honestly the way more important part. Who cares about the characters? Um, <laughs> in Kuroto Kaseki, you have dialogue choices that will affect the game in the story. You have a, uh, a, a alignment system in the game. <laughs> yeah, the tell, the me the tell me about so, the LGC alignment system. I mean, it seems like each. It seems like you have like three different paths. It's law. Chaos and gray. Not we're, wait, we're not we're not um, talking about SMT here. We're talking about uh, Kaseki. Yeah, right. And it just seems like depending on what choices you make in storyline and quest stuff, it'll affect like who you can like team up with, who yeah. you like, align yourself with in terms uh, of so, like, organizations. So like, so, yeah, they're saying like if you like have a high law value in the game, uh, depending on like what how you answer things and on what you do and like side quests and story. Like if you have a, a high law value, you can work for like organizations like the the bracer guild so like there's a there's a potential that like you'll be locked out of party members if you go a certain alignment so if you don't go the law like how if you don't work for the bracer guild maybe you don't have a zin as a party member in the game and oh yeah are you telling me that there's an alignment that i can go towards to get the least number of party members possible that's what I'm thinking too, but because when I think about uh, like uh, the the sorting situation and equipping all your party members and um, Cold Steel three, four, and Haji Mari, I'm like, you know what? Maybe, maybe, hopefully, there's an alignment where I just get like a core four, and that's it. That'd be awesome. Um, and, but um, more broadly speaking, I really wonder what if when they inevitably make a follow up to Kuro Kaseki with a sequel, like, but I'm sure this alignment system, whatever alignment you, you decide uh, leaving off with this game, I wonder if that has a rippling effect into like a future um, installment as well. I so. have my own theories about how that might tie in, considering the remaining Septarians. Mm-hmm. Like, namely, one of the big ones is the Time Septarian. Mm-hmm. So I'd imagine that they'll probably find a way to make all of them canon in a weird way. Oh, yeah. So it's, it's going to be... Really interesting to see how the how this alignment system shakes up because it it is like a new system to the to the series that you know hopefully it's fleshed out well enough. And we will look forward to it in uh twenty twenty four or later or five <laughs> or this I year if you're going to my it. copy of Kuro right as we speak. <laughs> like fuck you, I do what, what I want. I I don't know. I'm thinking about it. I think about it really hard. I wonder right. if I could get. I, I wonder if I could get Alex to let me write an import review. <laughs> Maybe. Are we done talking about Kaseki? Are we free? Please get us right. off the ship. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Sorry, George. Please We're free. Okay. I have no idea what just happened. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's let's go to another game that George knows nothing about. I don't think. And that is <laughs> one of Same. our favorites, I think, collectively. I don't know. I don't want to presume. I haven't played it yet, but I, I, I can already tell that it has the good vibes. And I'm old. We're, t- we're talking really about like Final Fantasy IX, otherwise known as the best one until 14, maybe. But yes, Final Fantasy IX, we had learned through like a production agency post that an animated TV show based on that game targeted towards 8 to 13 year olds is in development for the French market. Do I have that correct? I, I, I'm pretty sure it's a worldwide market, but like it's a French studio making it. All right. So basically, yeah, we're getting an animated TV show for Final Fantasy IX in some capacity. We don't really know much details other than that, except that it's targeted for that age group. Because, you know, Final Fantasy IX story, very suitable for 8 to 13 years old. It's kind of weird, though. I've seen a lot of people with that take where it's like, wait, why is this being marketed as a kid's show? Which I kind of originally had that take, too. But like, how old were we when we originally played that game? Around the same, Uh, right? No, I was like 60 years old. 
Oh, damn. How old are you? <laughs> and James is only like 10, right? <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> but so, yeah. So that's kind of the weird thing is that this isn't an anime adaptation of Final Fantasy IX or anything like that. It's a kid's show based on that. And but with the with the with a game that has a lot of very mature premises about like mortality and about like allegiance and th- a lot of things like that, so it is interesting to or it's interesting to think about exactly how they might adapt that to a younger audience. But I remember Adam was talking about this uh, off the cuff and when we were just like casually chatting, and you were more like not concerned that's too strong a word but interested more in like the history of this studio, the Cyber Group Studios. It seems like when you look at like what shows that this this developer or developer this production company has put out, it seems like it's a lot of like I don't know, like low quality looking shovelware ish shows, and maybe they're good. I don't know. It's like there, there's nothing splashy or fancy there. So it's like I'm more maybe concerned like is this studio any good versus you know the eight to thirteen year old rating? Yeah, yeah. When you when you when you think about the rating, like if you think about Avatar: The Last Airbender, like that show is targeting preteens um it's like a y7 rating avatar is most of the time and that show is enjoyed by a lot of people of all ages and it's not that's not impossible but i'm more just like the studio itself i don't know if i trust them but that's mostly out of unfamiliarity i think that the last like thing they've done that like it was remotely even close is like a mini ninja show right i think mini ninja show what (laughs) yep you missed out on it, that George. Makes, that takes me back. Yeah, I was probably not born yet. To be fair. <laughs> and by the way, the production on the show has not begun. According to the press release, it says uh, the the CEO of Cyber Group Studios, Pierre Sisman, that's a French name, um, says that the goal is to begin begin production by the end of this year, 2021, or the beginning of 2022. Episode counts not decided. You know, a lot of things aren't decided. I guess like the the contract has basically just been inked. So like. We're very, very much like ahead of the starting gate at this point. Oh, by the time I've seen some, I've seen some, uh, I've seen some speculation that like perhaps this wasn't supposed to be announced yet, but like the studio wanted it to be announced to get like see interest in it. So they, yeah, so they, maybe they like leaked it to a reporter or something. I mean, this is just weird, almost That's conspiracy funny. stuff now. But like, it's pretty much it is official now. Like it at, when it first came out, it was just like some outlets report but they put out like a press release and square enix has pretty much confirmed it now like so it's it's a it's a real thing speaking about the age group thing though like whether or not you can you believe that the themes of the game or the story of the game can work in that age bracket the more interesting thing is is that like in 2022 or 2023 whenever this shows up our kids that age are going to have no attachment to Final Fantasy IX, like at all. Like, or I won't say none. It's possible that their parents might have played it. God, I feel old. <laughs> but like, it just seems like a weird, a weird specific game to pick for this sort of thing at this time. I don't know. Yeah, like, well, that was sort of my nine. point. Like, why not? I guess like Seven has its own remake stuff like that. But it's what, really what, what if it was a what if it was a show for eight to thirteen year olds based off of Kingdom Hearts? I'd watch it. I'd watch it no matter what. <laughs> I would sit on the floor and eat popcorn. Easy. Watch that. that, that eat, was rude ages ago, but like, <laughs> yeah, you're lucky yeah, terms like, in front of a TV. <laughs> yeah, we, we know the median age for this uh, for this show. It's like they, they say it's eight to thirteen years old, but when you look at the statistics, it's like oh, it's like 30. a lot of fucking t- yeah, thirty plus people. Because we're like, oh, we remember Final Fantasy <laughs> Nine. It was pretty good. <laughs> I was thirteen when I so first all played thirty old sounds. <laughs> That's how this whole podcast sounds, except George. But, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, 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 yeah, if this doesn't begin production until next year, it might be a while before we get to revisit this. But it's weird to know that it's in the works, kind of unexpected, out of left field. Who knows if it'll end up even being any good at all. But, yeah, Final Fantasy IX. We'll talk about that more whenever James gets to it, I suppose. I'm going to guess... August. Probably late August is when I'll get to Final Fantasy IX. Because I need to get through all the games I'm playing in July, and then I'll just bum rush through 7 and 8, and then I'll reach 9 at the end of August. Yeah, we're, bum rush we're all, we're all, bank- we're all bon- banking on August being uh, quiet so that we can get back to our backlogs. Absolutely nothing, right, George? Yeah, nothing, nothing in August. <laughs> 
We're so sorry, George. You had to listen to us talk about Falcom. No, you know he likes uh, he this, likes this East now. Often. Yeah, I, I like East. So you know, I, I kind of get like maybe one word you said, <laughs> but like well, actually, it, this happens often where I just realized. So Brian can definitely review Zero Nature, but you have plenty of time to get caught up and be ready fuck to review you. those games Don't yourself. Fuck you doing, George? <laughs> Hell uh, no! <laughs> I haven't lost my bet yet. I know that's a different. Um, who is it that I'm supposed to be doing? Oh, no, no. Okay, that's insulting. Don't don't compare Falcon. <laughs> no, I'm not the same. <laughs> but I'm not, I'm not doing another bet catch-up. No way. <laughs> yeah, this is what you deserve for bringing up Marvel every other podcast. <laughs> True, yeah. I've heard this. All right, so we have a bunch of little smaller news to kind of wrap up through at the end. Uh, a longer list, but a lot of quick hits. So let's see uh, what we end up stumbling on here. We talked about this briefly earlier, but uh, Near Replicant has surpassed 1 million shipped units, and Near Automata has surpassed 6 million. So uh, it just reached the 5.5 million mark a couple months ago, and now it's at 6. The Replicant has hit the 1 million mark, which is something I believe the original game never did. Uh, so. Exciting stuff for the near franchise, and they're, unfortunately, they're getting, they're getting closer and closer to uh, the 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 cheeky remark they made on that one live stream of like of the near replicant re release has to uh, sell uh, half of what Automata did at the time. So it was a five million at the time, so it had to sell two point yes, five million to get the near gestalt, the Papa near end. Uh, <laughs> Let's see if they'll let's see if they'll honor it if it reaches it reaches. Everyone it. buy a second copy and we'll be there. Or most we'll we'll right. there. Yeah, and then we have all go tweet Taro and Sight Dub like, what the fuck, guys? We did it. Uh we have a upcoming launch date for a upcoming RPG. This I don't know who is the most interested in this out of this podcast, but Atelier Online Alchemist of Bressasil will launch in English on July 8th. Anyone? I like Atelier, but I I have <laughs> no interest in a, in um a mobile MMO. No, yeah, I know. no. Um, good luck. <laughs> if I wanted to get the experience of the average uh, mobile like compilation title for a game game series, I would just play uh, Nelk and the Legendary Alchemists and basically get the same experience, but without submitting to a gotcha. A couple other release dates uh, for just just some bit news here. Dragon Star Varnier, the uh, Idea Factory game that originally released in 2018, is launching for Nintendo Switch on August 3rd. You never reviewed this game. No one was <laughs> interested, like, and no yeah, one has ever been interested. Okay. If you love Dragon Star Varnier, mm -hmm. let us know in the comments. <laughs> maybe, maybe George will review it. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> wow, no. George. You didn't, even, you didn't even know anything about this game. You already decided you hate it? That's fucked up, George. <laughs> game general, we're, such, we're such boys. <laughs> Here's another release date that's for uh, later this month. Actually, in just a couple days, honestly. Uh, Greedfall Gold Edition is launching for PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X and S on June 30th, along with the Devesp conspiracy expansion so i'm at, I'm at my typical i think i've mentioned this on a previous podcast where this happened this is the exact same thing that happened with the outer worlds for me where the game released i liked it enough i didn't love it i liked it same with greedfall i liked it i thought it was uh batting like it, it punched above its weight but i have like no interest in revisiting it for extra content like it's been too long i guess because greedfall originally released in 2019 so this is a year and a half later it's getting a dlc pack like i'm just not Almost interested in years, it really <laughs> yeah really uh because yeah it would have been like september 2019 to july uh late june 2021 so greedfall i think is a very promising game for spider studio i think it, it is the most endearing type of euro jank there is i'm just I don't know. I feel like I'm the I am I feel like I'm like the champion of this game for this podcast. I liked it a lot. I reviewed it. I have no interest in the CLC like at all. Like it would be out of obligation if I end up playing this. Uh oh, I bet I better go play this so I know what I'm talking about if I'm talking about this game ever again. 
So I don't know. Maybe that's maybe that's not the not a thing the type of thing to admit, but like <laughs> it's getting an expansion releasing in uh or a DLC pack releasing in a week. So yay. Here's another more exciting update. This is for Sakana of Rice and Ruin, which we talked a few a month ago or a few weeks ago, had finally reached the 1 million sales mark. It had a surprising best update of all time, where now you can carry both a dog and a cat at the same time. You can dual wield animals. Yeah. I mean, literally the best update ever made to any game <laughs> ever. And yeah, it might, it might be. But when you return home after like going out and dungeon exploring or whatever, the dog will like bark and greet you. Like he'll run up to you and ask to be picked up and petted. Aww. So just like in real life from from for most of us. <laughs> yeah. Game, game, I do. Game, I, I actually game like I, So this game is done really well. Like right now, it's basically it, it's just as successful as New Replicant. But um, uh, I'm wondering. I, so like the the can you pet the dog Twitter account like tweeted about these things and it's literally getting like a hundred thousand likes and you know lots of retweets as well and I'm actually wondering like how many people might pick up the game because of this like it's it's probably not completely negligible that some people who didn't know this game existed see this stuff and like I'm curious about this now yeah the moment this was announced I knew how can I pet the dog was immediately gonna like latch onto this yep. for good reason like not cynically like this is something they have yeah. they're obligated to shout this from the rooftops <laughs> look there's, just... there's a very wholesome update there's uh good vibes all around i still love how thanks to the capcom leak we know that at least one well first off they outright um for monster hunter rise knew what they were doing with the palamutes and outright were trying to get how uh, can you pet the dog to uh signal boost uh the game because of being able to pet them the most important yeah. megaphone of our era powerful if, social media if you can somehow get engagement from that account like just start seeing like dogs shoehorned into other games like oh here's uh <laughs> here's the doom follow-up and here's a demon dog you could pet or <laughs> something like that what if what if what if doom 3 has the bunny and like you can pet the oh bunny. yeah the, yeah the bunny oh that'd be cool <laughs> do you even know what we're talking about george Daisy. Yeah. Oh, okay. The bunny All in right. uh, well, Doom and Doom Eternal. There's like a like a portrait of him. Yeah. How dare you? <laughs> I'm sorry for assuming. All right, a couple other things at the bottom here. Uh, here's another release date for uh, on the Japanese side of things. We have a remaster for Nights in Nightmare. Nights we'll use for an intent. Nights in the Nightmare. I'm sorry. Nights in the Nightmare. We'll launch in Japan for Nintendo Switch and mobile devices in 2021. I do not I do not know anything about this game. Someone give me like the explain it like I'm five. What is Nights in the Nightmare? It's a PSP game. So basically, um, it's from Sting. Sting is a Japanese development company, mostly doing uh strategy RPGs, I believe. Didn't they do the Utawara Mono stuff? The 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 uh gameplay part of that, or am I making that up? Uh, yeah, I believe, well, I'm not sure if Sting did Utwari Mono. I know that they did the Dungeon Travelers games. Oh, okay. But Let they've done, um, they've done a lot of strategy RPGs and, um, like even spinoffs for other companies. And so that a lot of their games are strategy RPGs. And this is part of their series that they call Department Heaven. They originally released on like DS and then PSP. They, Atlas, USA released a lot of them back in the day, but Atlas USA doesn't really go outside of Atlas Sega stuff anymore, Atlas West. Um, so there have been right. a few of these games in this series that have been remastered in Japan, like Igri Union, but they haven't been brought over to the West because like they need somebody to license it, and I don't know if anyone's willing to do that. So, Okay, so I just double-checked, and yes, Sting also did the Utoru Mono games ever since uh, the... Uh... Um, console port of the original on PS2. Yeah, they also did yeah. Hyper Devotion Noir. So I yeah, maybe... which is the strategy RPG of the uh, Neptunia series. That's basically their thing. I believe yeah. Nights in the Nightmare is supposed to be like a mix between like 
strategy RPG and actually like some sort of like stick shooter or something or something. Yeah, sort it's, of... it's it's so it's so it was a weird game. I remember that I played on PSP, but but I can't remember the specifics. I just remember it was like it was like whoa, it was a little bizarre game. I actually own all of these games on PSP, and I just haven't played them yet. Too many games. Yeah, too many games. We have a Square Enix announcement to talk about that I did not know anything about until approximately three hours and 23 minutes ago. And that is a multimedia project called Deep Insanity. And there's three parts that we know about this right now. We have Deep Insanity Asylum, an RPG for PC and mobile devices. We have an anime, Deep Insanity, Deep Insanity The Lost Child. And Deep Insanity Nirvana is a manga alongside. So I watched the trailer for the RPG for the PC slash mobile game. And I obviously it's for Japanese trailer because this is just recently announced on that side of things. Uh, all I can really talk about is that the art style is kind of striking. But I don't know if you had any other details about this multimedia project that Square Enix unveiled a few days ago. Josh, sorry, I should have said a name oh. on that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean... The, not really. They just said that, like, Square Enix just kind of announced this out of nowhere. Like, hey, we're doing this cross media project. Um, they uh, announced the staff for like the anime that's airing this October with Silver Link as the studio, and then the staff members behind it. Um, the RPG itself, it's a free to play title with uh, in app purchases. Um, uh, obviously, there's not uh, any plans to localize it as yet. Who knows if it will? Um, Pre registration is up. Um, the, the Gematsu uh, has uh, translated most of this, and then uh, they describe it as uh, battles are skill selection based battles that progress in real time. There's also auto and high speed functions for it, but as for what like the premise is for the game, I'm not really sure. It's like a post apocalyptic type of deal. Um, and yeah, that's just you know an another RPG incoming. Uh, who knows if how this will go. And if you go to the official webpage for this, it literally divides it up into anime, manga, game. Like that's the three pillars of this multimedia project. So yeah, I don't know. Like I guess I we'll see if if this ends up being picked up by a, a global publisher or if Square Enix plans to bring it over or what. But watch it. The next big thing. It's like it's like an immediate hit. Everyone loves it. It's just everywhere the next year. Here's a big one. Here's the final news bit of the night. Uh, all right. Hit me. Ooh, 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 all right. Uh-huh. Right. <laughs> George is psyched, dude. I looked ahead. I looked ahead. Cyberpunk 2077 is back on the Woo! PlayStation Network. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I suppose to play this. <laughs> okay, well, well, okay, well, well, what's the caveat? Well, uh, it, it's been out for almost a half a year. From the PSN, or maybe even half a year. Well, what what happened? Did they change something? What happened? Uh, yeah, they did. So they've modified the PS4 version so that a lot of graphical features are missing, but now it runs at a somewhat stable frame rate. Though they do, though you should, it should be noted that on, that they do recommend that players only play it on a PS4 Pro or PS5. PS4 is in a better state, but they're still saying, yeah, if you have a PS4 amateur, amateur, you shouldn't play Cyberpunk. <laughs> it's so, like, I'm still oh, interested what? in giving this game like a legitimate shot, but it's like if it's still being patched out and bug and you know like tweaked up and whatever. Like I'm, I'm planning on playing the PC version, but like I, I'm not in any hurry. Like I'll just so wait. It's so, uh, it's so funny because like uh, like some friends, uh, their anecdotes like they just fired the game up, tried to fire their game up again, like like maybe two or three weeks ago it's like yeah this is like buggier than when we last picked it up <laughs> a few months back they're like this feels a lot mm. more buggy than you remember so i, it's like, so I pulled uh, up the okay. store page for this and this is literally the very first line underneath the add to cart button important notice users continue to experience performance issues with this game purchase for use on ps4 systems is not recommended for best cyberpunk experience on PlayStation, play on PS4 Pro and PS5 systems. <laughs> so literally the very first thing it says about like, then the next line is cyberpunk is an open world action game, blah, blah, blah. And yeah, then it goes into the premise of the game. The very first thing it says is don't buy this on PS4. Please God. That's, so. <laughs> this is such an interesting Imagine situation. That. Like, like, what? like how, like what other, has this happened in any other case? <laughs> 
I can't think of anything this yeah. year. Does Life of Black Tiger have a have a have a <laughs> warning label? No, no, the closest they... thing I can think of is like like games like Xenoblade on on the 3DS. It's like you could only play it on the new version of the 3DS. I think, the but closest... uh, like you couldn't even play it on regular. Anyway, I think the, like closest the closest thing. analog here would be um, Hyrule Warriors on 3DS, where. Everyone agreed that you should not play it on the original 3DS. If you're going to play oh, okay. the 3DS version, play it on new 3DS. Now, Nintendo didn't officially do this, but they did yeah. the next best thing where they released Fire Emblem Warriors on new 3DS exclusively, basically saying, yeah, we shouldn't have had this run on the original 3DS in the first place. I, I was kind of thinking along the same lines with uh, uh, Xenoblade, but yeah, like some mid gen system upgrade where it only could play on like the second half of the gen yeah, it does make you wonder, like is there is there a possibility of that if if in th- four years or three years we get a ps5 pro or an xbox series t whatever they go with next who knows that uh we end up getting like exclusive games to the for the mid-gen refresh because we still have games releasing that like have to work on base xbox one so yeah eventually you gotta have to like snip that off or something just yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, 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 it's starting like you know, Microsoft really wants to pivot to like how the mobile model works. So if they if it follows that trajectory, then yes, if, when you get to like to the second or third generation of Xbox Series, whatever letter or number they're gonna give it, at some point, once you get to a certain generation of Xbox Series, there might be a point where oh, this game can no longer run on Series S and X because we're so far in, in advanced, like how the mobile ecosystem works, especially with Apple. Like oh, you, this. This app, no, the, this new app coming to like this uh, iOS version, no oh, one works on like iOS seven later or whatever. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I can't wait until the alphabet soup after Xbox releases in like eight years, where it's like this works on not S, that'll be old by that point, but like X, T, B, R, and T or yeah. B or whatever. I <laughs> just like have this yeah. soup of letters behind every Xbox game. Like this is what it'll work on. <laughs> Exciting okay, time. like I, I I was looking on this uh, Cyberpunk uh, PSN page. Uh, the uh, the other thing is worthy to know is the release date on it is June twentieth. Now it's not the original release date on it. <laughs> um, and, and it's also funny that I don't know if this was it, this is probably in the original listing, but under genre, it's called unique uh, for the genre <laughs> listing. Oh, <laughs> like, my favorite genre right. of video games, unique. Yeah, at Scarlet Nexus, Great. right there. Unique. Oh yeah, oh. that's that's uh, that's our. That's our new website, unique site. Unique. Oh. <laughs> yeah, we only oh, cover unique that, right? games. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, so yeah, Cyberpunk's back on PSN. Uh, Congratulations, it, I guess. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's it's for for fifty dollars, <laughs> not sixty dollars. It's fifty dollars on PSN. So. That's still like yeah, no, don't pay fifty dollars <laughs> for that. Ridiculous. Cyberpunk will be another one of those games where, like, in a year and a half, they'll announce like. It's whatever its version of Blood and Wine is, or whatever, and I'll be like, "Yeah, I've had enough. Like, I'm not interested anymore." <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, uh, that was a normal length podcast. Totally, totally mm-hmm. expected duration of three and a half hours. Uh, Great. As always, if you missed the end, <laughs> thank you, and we're sorry. <laughs> but yeah, lots of. I mean, we had so, like I don't feel like anything that we talked about should have been cut out in the sake of time like we everything we everything we touched on from ion classic to scarlet nexus to all the kaseki news to maybe we could have left off dragon star varnier because <laughs> no one cares about that apparently <laughs> uh but yeah i it feels good kind of to be back to normalcy even if there was still a ton to talk about this is what we get for covering such a breadth of types of games that all somehow get labeled as rpgs because which is the foggiest genre specification ever which is why we love it i presume but yeah all the features that we talked about up on the site i won't go through them all again but they're all up there a lot of them from new contributors so do please visit rpgsite.net and check out everything you're interested in either on the covers or on the feature list we do have a discord channel uh linked from the homepage. it's discord.com slash rpg site we have some interest in talking about Scarlet Nexus. Some people are still talking about uh, Nier and Monster Hunter and all other sorts of games that are releasing in this busy May, June, July period. We've got the preview video from Monster Hunter up on the YouTube video, along with some other more recent previews like uh, Cullen's Neo, The World Ends With You preview from a few weeks back. And we're on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. to search for RPG site. You'll probably find us. Thanks for listening. We will be back next week with, I'm sure, a ton more news and impressions and everything that goes with what we talk about on this podcast. 
Until you hear from us next time, take care, stay safe. Talk to you then.